pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our first actual board meeting of the year, school year. Um, to start off our meeting, we have special presentations, and um, Dr. Kaiser is going to take care of those. Um, our first uh, presentation, uh, Mr. Wiley Kraft will do some introductions, and we're real excited about an award one of our students won. So, Wiley, we'll turn it over to you. Yeah, I think it was March of last year, I got an email across my, desk, or across my uh, inbox saying, hey, here's a great idea for a video contest. Uh, we should do, we should try to win a uh, defibrillator, heart defibrillator, or among other prizes. <coughs> uh, man, I'd love to do this, but I don't have the time for it. Uh, luckily, I had uh, Michaela Ward. Uh, I have Michaela for three years. Uh, all three years I've been at Beach Grove. Michaela's been my student. This has been the first year without her. Uh, it has been quiet in my room for sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, but Michaela was uh, taking an independent study class last year, uh, so she was working on videos uh, on her free time during my prep uh, without much supervision. And I was lucky enough that I knew Michaela, I trust Michaela, I just said, hey Michaela, I got this email. And I forwarded it to her and she, uh, she took care of everything. She planned it all out. She um, shot all the video. She edited all the video, and all I, all, you know, she just brought it to me and says, "How's this? Yes, do it. Looks good." So, um, here, I'll play the video for you. That in, uh, we put it on YouTube and sent it in to um, uh, contest and uh, Mr. Doug Meyer is here to uh, present us with um, the things that we want. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Beach Grove community schools for the opportunity to come tonight. Mr. Kraft, Michaela, uh, for all of their hard work. Um, my name is Doug Meyer. I'm with Giving Hearts a Hand. We're a local nonprofit that funds cardiac screenings in high school athletes. 
Um, we've been working with area schools in central Indiana and southeast Indiana for the last few years. And to this date, we've been able to fund about 300 cardiac screenings. Um, tonight's kind of a special night. Um, since our organization works in the area, um, an organization, national organization, Parent Heart Watch, had contacted us. And um, they had offered the, the contest um, along with HeartSign Technologies and um, had created this contest called Heart Avengers, uh, which was an AED grant program that was offered through HeartSign Technologies and Parent Heart Watch, designed to provide schools in the United States with the opportunity to receive an automated external defibrillator uh, for their facilities. Designed to prevent sudden cardiac death, an AED is a medical device that quickly analyzes the heart's rhythm and safely delivers an electric, an electric shock in the event of sudden cardiac arrest. On behalf of Heart Avengers, the Heart Avengers contest that Parent Heart Watch and Heart Sign offered, I would like to congratulate the students of Beach Grove High School for being selected as one of the winning schools to win an automatic external defibrillator. Congratulations to Michaela and Mr. Kraft. Obviously, the Hornet students see the importance of cardiac awareness and the seriousness of car sudden cardiac arrest. We have all seen the tragedies of a student passing away unexpectedly, unexpectedly, occurring a couple of times per week across America on school campuses. Again, we congratulate the students responsible for the video uh, entered in the contest, as well as the administration, faculty, and other students who are committed to promoting cardiac awareness. That's her trophy to take home. <laughs> again, we thank everybody for the hard work on that. Again, again congratulations on the great things you're doing as a student at Beach Grove High School. You're a real superstar for us. Uh, our next uh, presenter is Mr. Scott Bradford. Bradford. He's going to tell us the fun things he did this summer, did our his six weeks. Uh, well, you weren't actually gone six weeks this summer, but for his time away, they had a little bit of fun uh, on a visit. So, Scott, why don't you tell us about that? Thank you. And first off, thank you for letting me speak to you because I had invited myself by <laughs> yourself to the party. Oh, I, don't think I, I got that great food. Um, really, what I came to do to invite myself was to brag on our students and thank you all. Beach Grove Education Foundation, the board, of course, the city schools, the Chamber of Commerce, so many people that said yes to an incredible trip, an incredible project. And all that sounds like I just speak because it did to me too, but it's so true. I'm, when I'm out with singers meeting other schools, doing festivals, someone say, how do you get to do that? Is your corporation still allowing that? And that's really because of our board and your wisdom to those out of classroom experiences. And we were blessed to do that. And blessed means we didn't want to come home. <laughs> that is the truth. It is the very, um, we had 30 people on the trip. I had 16 singers. We had parents, alumni, um, guests. It, just, it was just a fantastic trip. I came here and I spoke with great enthusiasm about Hong Kong years back, and I had no vision of doing other trips, but it just kind of came about, and it was tremendous. Second thing I want to do is I want to also let you know how proud I was of our students. You have in front of you posters and the concert brochures presented to us by MCI, which is our travel company. Um, they did a phenomenal job picking out people. We travel with Luca, our bus driver, who during the World Cup, and you can bet Luca was pretty well going for Italy. He said, you got to cheer tonight. And we'd be in the hotel, and it was just a roar of people and crowd. And uh, Stefania, Stephanie, she was a jazz singer herself, and we didn't know that. She was from the Tuscany area. And all she kept telling us is, you've got to come see my place. You've got to see my country, my country. And that pride filled over to us. When I was here talking about other trips in Hong Kong, I told you I felt so proud to be an American, seeing us against the Hong Kong and the students and the educators and the young students. The pride I felt with Italy, however, this time was for us, for Beach Grove. We saw amazing things. We got to learn the culture. We got to be immersed in there. And that's the difference. If we've all traveled abroad some of us, but it, for those of us that have for any type of vacation, you get to relax and you get to enjoy the beautiful sights that are here in these photos, but you don't make the relationships all the time unless you spend a lot of time. And in a week's time, to get to travel with the locals and to get to meet people who are in the business and 
we had guests upon guests help us, such as in Florence when we performed. We had my boss, such as a music travel consultant, her boss, and then the guy you know, internationally. They were all there being our translators and checking up on them as well as the tour for us. Just happened that way. It's probably a nice getaway for them. But it was, it was kind of nerve wracking. The singers were poised and elegant. They had to dress respectfully because you have to cover your shoulders and your knees, and it was phenomenal. I, mean, I could tell you on and on and on, I thought the pictures would be fantastic. And so I'll do those in a moment. But I also want to tell you the other part of my pride is the amount of money we raised. We and us, we Coralie, our Coral parents and whatnot, we raised close to $18,000. Each student was given $1,000 off their trip, which I thought made it more where we would have more singers. But either way, it didn't come out that way, but at least it made it affordable for our Beach Grove students and community. The adults themselves who did all the hard work didn't go to them except for the experiences, the kids, and the, if you sang, you got that $1,000 credit. And that was, I was very proud of that, and I was glad we got to do that. Um, that. That pride, of course, I want to share with you. When you walk into this kind of thing, it's always like, oh, picture, picture, picture. Mm -hmm. But these were all taken from my camera, and we have a ton. We have DVDs. The brochures, the pamphlets, the programming they did. You can imagine walking into Florence yourself and go, oh my gosh, there's my kids, you know? And then we would round the corner and it so happened that Dr. Eric Stark from Butler's was performing at the same cathedral the next week. And it was, you know, a small school, small city, six degrees, and it was amazing. So every event was phenomenal, as you can see. We get off the streets and can you, we were hot and sweaty. It was a heat wave in Venice. While you were all having a cold wave, we actually had 97 degrees plus. And so we were hot and tired from the trip, no sleep for the amount of time. And this is one of our first sights. We got to see where it rose. Mm -hmm. And it, it is absolutely breathtaking and pictorial. The kids learned about history, culture, cuisine, respect for gods, patriarchs, emperors, and just all the amazing things that were there. We had a tour every day with headsets, so the educational value was immense. What we were seeing, what, what was there, centuries to create things, centuries to move the economic status and how things were, and of course, that's what you expect. The streets of Venice are just beautiful. I took my first selfie, however, at the, um, yeah, at the Coliseum. I thought, I'll never take a selfie. I'm too old. I don't want to do that stuff. I took my first <laughs> at the Coliseum. So <laughs> as we get there, they used to hang people there in the corner during those days, and it, it has changed and changed. We saw museums, cathedrals. Mm -hmm. The respect for something beyond yourself is what happens in a trip like this. And as you can see, amazing culture and traditions, I said. This, I had a run away from the tour, and I was the bad guy, because this was in the song we sang there, as well as um, what we had practiced all season for chorale. The Ecce Angelica Domini, basically I am the handmaiden of the Lord. It's about Mary accepting the birth of Christ. And of course with that Catholic background, it was etched in this door. And it just, all the kids were like, they have that on the door right there. I go, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Talk about relevance. And then we sang it the next night in Florence and two nights after that in Rome. Mm -hmm. It was phenomenal. Um, every place you went, there was amazing statues and you couldn't keep up with the history lesson and the whether it was the artist representing themselves or they were being paid politically to represent the person of deity at that time, if you will, politic deity. Um, they, it, we learned so much and, and the kids remembered and they would talk about it and their photographs were just amazing. And as I stood in front of this, it had white, pink, and green marble. The rose-colored marble and the purity for that and hope and charity were all the meanings. And this was called Santa Maria. And Santa Maria was amazing. Holy cow is what I wrote there. Mm -hmm. It's one of the first things we saw. And they took all of this marble from Rome. And that's how some of the ruins became more ruins. Some of the um, popes at the time would be economical and take that marble and stone and made elaborate and, and amazing churches. This was one of the first domes built. And it is two layered. And they, ha they did it without scaffolding or ladders. And it was amazing. They decided, you know, laid upon each other. And after they, that was commissioned, I think it took 300 years, which seems quick to do that. 
been amazing. Then we went to Siena, which is basically a, as I say, saddle up. It was, it had a lot of horse and that type of community. You can see the stands there, et cetera. But it was one of those, you had to take a panorama. It is amazing. It's in the Tuscany area. Um, shops and pizza and gelato, and this is a day of shopping. Okay, so the merchants in the food here circling around, kind of like Brussels. And then when you get to Rome, it's just amazing. The thing we didn't expect is kind of New York buildings, you know, lights and all that to be in the field and isolated out. And Remus and Romulus, with the development of that culture in the fall of the Roman Empire, it's tremendous. It's a little odd as far as their national flag, but it's a tremendous visual columns everywhere, and I said, you just turn the corner and peeking throughout buildings, you get this amazing structure. You know, and as you go downtown Indianapolis, you see tremendous architecture, but the amount and the historical significance and the age of this was phenomenal. There's the Basilica. Can you imagine seeing Vatican City and the Colosseum in one day? That's what we had to do because it rained one day, so we enjoyed the rain, but there you go. The lower half the Colosseum, the understanding of how that was built in the years and the class system. Like I said, educationally phenomenal. I decided not to bless you with my selfie. This is the photo after. <laughs> okay, because I look like an old guy with sunglasses. That's about it, right there. And we wanted to say thank you. This isn't everybody, but it's myself, at least one of my daughters there, some of the children that sang, alumni as well, graduates, on and on and on. I have a letter from Mrs. Anderson, Debbie Anderson, who went, and her daughter, who's there in the picture. Debbie Anderson's part of the foundation. She's very active. She's a transfer student or parent out of district. And she wanted me to apologize to you because she sincerely wanted to come and thank you, but didn't have enough time off after taking this trip. And she's been involved in the vocal jazz, the Harlem Wizards, does money for so many of us as far as fundraising and collections. So very advocate for our program as well as the district. And she's very grateful. And she allowed me to summarize and read part of this, and I will. She said, in, to paraphrase, she said, it's an amazing trip. Gabby, Gabby is saving up to go again, and Gabby Anderson's her daughter. She says, we're looking at college opportunities abroad, knowing that Jessica Hall's sister went there to study. And she says, myself, now as a parent from going from this, what I gain more than anything is the comfort that my daughter could do this. Huge, just for one family. That's a huge step for someone to understand the world around them, that it's different and they can tackle it. Trite, right? But so sincere in her words. She said, Gabby loved performing in Italy because the audience didn't judge our choir for the vocal presentation, which was great. They didn't know that Beach Grove was a small school. They didn't care how much budget we had for arts or anything. What they did know is how we looked or what we were wearing, the elegant gowns, and even at the rehearsal, it was raining, remember, the church was filled. The church was filled with people who wanted to hear more. They were appreciative of the respect of the music and there was unending applause. Did you not hear that at the concert? The audience even wanted an encore. Many people around me from Brussels, all over the country and all over the nation, excuse me, wanted you to sing more. I didn't notice, I was just rehearsing, you know, so there you go. Song selections were the reason why they were so well received. Italy is a very strong, traditional country in their attitude and respect for the church and for each other. The piety of the songs and the Latin words were important to the audience, and all the pews and chairs were filled. It was standing room only during the Rome rehearsal. To kind of give you what she had learned, I've already given you that. The culture experiences, the respect, and of course the religious background. Um, to end up, thank you. I can't believe, you know, when I was 21 year old and, and doing education, I didn't think that I'd be taking students abroad. As a 32 year, this year educator and 28, I think, in this system, I'm so proud of what you allow us to do and what I've been able to do with these kids. And they don't get it until they get there. You know, they were kids. They didn't want to come to rehearsals. They didn't want to work hard. And I said, I, it will matter when you get there. It will matter. And like adults, you can't tell them. All you can do is show them. And thank you allowing us to go and showing them something besides Beach Grove. Even though it's great, there's more. There's a lot more. So thank you very much. We do appreciate it. Thank you.
the next trip. <laughs> I told my wife, not. <laughs> <laughs> two years in planning, it was a lot. And, you know, the first two weeks prior, I said, oh, I'm not doing this again. And then you get there, you go, can't wait. Uh -huh. Now I'm just coasting on. Let me coast a while. <laughs> Scott, could you just connect your uh, computer so I can I'm steal? I'm going to try. Yes. So I can steal the uh, there. protector. I'm going to give a little introduction to the doctor. Uh, uh, we'll give a little principal first. Can you just do whatever you want? Whatever you want. Okay. 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 So it's going to be inside of that. I guess. I hope. This is our new Apple TV that's going in in our buildings. It's really nice. It's, he just had it. And Oh, I had it for a second. Mm -hmm. We have this in, uh, that's weird. Dr. Kaiser, you're not doing a very good job oh, okay. of stealing the show. <laughs> okay. Well, basically what I have up here on the screen, it may pop up here in a second, but one of the things that Melody and I and Laura and Tom have been working on is our communication plan. And, and what we mean by that, and, and it's in our board packet, I put it in there, but, you know, if we work together, together everyone accomplishes more. Our, our goal is to constantly communicate to our, our teachers, our, our staff. I can do it. Okay, great. Uh, you know, every, really everybody in the community. We're fortunate that we have Wiley Kraft uh, and his team of students that run our, our local cable channel, which is a great source. Uh, we have a hornet blast. We have just multiple forces. And one of our goals for this year is to really put together a strategic plan on how we communicate. Uh, you know, we think we do a pretty good job, but we always have holes in our cheese. You know, what, we can, what can we do better? And, and, and quite frankly, part of this is to fight against social media. You know, it's very easy to get on social media. And, you know, there was a, a, a mom today about a bus. And, you know, well, the bus went flying by me and, you know, missed my kid. Well. You know, maybe you apply the 15 minute rule and always be there 15 minutes and you should be. That's what I teach my kids. They're not always perfect, but was it the bus driver's fault? Was your time wrong? So it's easy to get on social media and communicate. So we have to do a, a yeoman's job in doing that. And and if, if Dr. Hammond will just kind of scroll, uh, scroll through this, you know, that's just a kind of a motto we've accomplished to this. It's all about team. You know, we talk to our teachers about this. We talk to our administrative. Uh, meetings. There's no I in the letter team. It's we, it's us, it's our team, it's our community, it's our kids. And, you know, if we're going to be successful, it, it, you know, it lies with us and everything that we do all the time. You can never over communicate. And, you know, just an example right there, for example, our board policies. We now have those online and all you have to do is go to our website and you can look at those and you can search them by topic. Uh, we have a district strategic plan that's on the website. Uh, tonight we're gonna, we, we have a lot of information on district bullying, but maybe we don't do a good enough job in, in presenting that so the community understands. So every year in August, from this point on, as far as our, com our communication plan, we don't have student of the month. So the principals are gonna talk a little bit about that. Uh, again, this is just a very, very beginning. Uh, Robin today copied how many 10 district plans, communication plans. So. We're going to be bringing back to the board, sharing with the community, uh, and working through our, our district community council this year on how do we communicate better. And so to start with that, uh, Laura, you want to invite our principals up to give a brief explanation. And they're, they're going to focus a little bit on what they do in bully prevention. And in your Dropbox, there is a plethora mm -hmm. of stuff. And we have tabs on the web page, and we have a lot of information. We have science at schools. And we, we think we go above and beyond, but it's never enough. You know, no student should ever feel intimidated. No student should ever feel uncomfortable. But the key is the student has to communicate with adults. You know, it's easy to say, I've been bullied and go home, but they never talk to an administrator, never talk to a teacher. Our, our teachers are there in the hallways, they're <coughs> visible. And, and, and we have to get past that with our kids to let them know it's okay if someone's putting you in a bad situation to come talk about it. So, uh, Dr. Hammock, uh, Melody, would you like to anything to our concept on communication plan, what we're trying to get accomplished? We're just trying to make sure we're very transparent and really communicate what we do. Um, I think that maybe some people will be surprised at what we do, that our staff, that we go through annual training, 
um, every single year, and that's you know it's something that we recognize. What what is bullying? Is it just being that somebody's saying something bad to another child, or is it really truly bullying? And there's a definition for bullying. So we're just trying to be transparent. We do. I mean, Dr. Hammock has an entire folder too. It's a paper copy. It's on the website. Um, you'd be surprised if you come and walk around our schools um, that the bulletin boards, for instance, at South Grove when at, for back to school night, there are so many bulletin boards and signs about how to be a buddy and not a bully and things like that. And that occurs in all of our schools. So I think that we just want to be very transparent. We want you to know what we're doing and to give us feedback as a community. When something does occur, you have to go to that teacher, that principal, and talk to them about something that has occurred with your child. Thanks, Melody. That's exactly right. The, um, <clears throat> the board might remember last year we kind of updated you all on um, the new legislation that happened as a result of, of um, the, the legislators deciding that really the bullying law for the state of Indiana needed to be enhanced. Um, it needed to be more robust and they gave um, you know, sort of uh, requirements that were rolled out to all school districts across the state as far as updated measures that needed to be put into place um, really for last school year um, in order to kind of meet the requirements that were established. Um, in your Dropbox, and, and I'll kind of pull, pull up um, the, the first document here that's called New Bullying Legislation. When the new legislation came out last year, we, we made a really intentional effort to first off pull in all of our homeschool advisors. Um, we had a district-wide <laughs> meeting with our homeschool advisors where we re went through each of the new requirements that were, were mandated for schools. And we really wanted to get feedback from our homeschool advisors on sort of what's happening now because we wanted to kind of check in to see where our holes were and what we needed to fill in in order to meet the, the standards that were established. We went through each of the requirements with the homeschool advisors. They brought up some great questions. They identified some gaps that we had. So then we took that information and then as an administrative team had our entire administrative team go through the requirements and then really outline what components of these requirements we had to <coughs> fill in in order to meet the law. Um, the first requirement, there was a complete overhaul of the way we actually uh, sort of indicate bullying, how, how we track bullying. You, you all might be surprised. We actually have to indicate for every incident of actual bullying that is reported at a school, it has to be inputted into SDS, which is our student management system. A bullying report has to be filed. That report at the end of every school year is uploaded data to the state, and then the state publishes that information. That's all new. Could you clarify for everybody what our definition of bullying is? Yes, absolutely. I would love to do that. So um, bullying, and if, if you can kind of um, scroll with me down, if you're in your Dropbox on that new bullying legislation, the second requirement was just to create a safe school committee. We had that in place, and we even um, increased that to kind of have a district uh, safe school committee that meets quarterly. Um, you, you scroll, scroll bullying prevention program uh, that was in place. We have um, multi-facets for the bullying prevention program. First off, every staff member in these row, and we don't just mean teachers, we mean every single staff member. We mean, we mean bus drivers, we mean our maintenance guys, we mean everyone is required to go through an online safeschools.com bullying prevention program. So we, it is required. Everyone, it is all documented. We are able to kind of run a list on who is actually taking the training, and um, that's a mandate. We also have um, lots of other ways that we're um, delivering bullying prevention training. Um, you're going to find when we go through, this is our entire bullying curriculum that has been developed sort of K-12 as a result of these new requirements. Um, which is all based on training not only our staff, but then ultimately training our boys and girls. Uh, number four, um, this is uh, the way in which we um, are uh, now responsible for not only being responsible as a school district for bullying on campus, 
but you might remember this is when we are now as school districts responsible for bullying episodes that occur off campus if those bullying incidents impact the school day somehow so there could be events that take place um, you know at, at a non-school sponsored event outside of the school boundaries but if that event makes its way into school it is absolutely the school's responsibility this is too where it became known that schools were responsible for any sort of online bullying that was taking place so even social media traffic that wasn't even anything that was you know sort of aligned with beach grove city schools if it came to school it became the school district's responsibility scrolling a little bit more this is where bullying is actually defined, Janice, and I, thanks for that question. So there, there was a new statutory definition for bullying. They defined what bullying is, and I, what I really like is they also define what bullying is not, you know, because that helps me sometimes to sort of delineate between what it is and what it isn't. So I don't know, you know, how much of that you want me to read out loud, but overt, unwanted, repeated acts or gestures, including verbal or written communications, transmitted in any manner. So that's digitally or electronically as well. Uh, some of the words that you're going to, um, you know, sort of hear are repeated. That is a, an, an absolute standard for bullying. It has to be something that has been documented to be repeated over time. So isolated incidents aren't necessarily bullying but isolated incidents are a problem. You know, we're not sort of saying, oh, we would turn our shoulder to one sort of incident, but in order for something to be classified bullying, it has to be repeated over time. I, I wanna ask you another question. Please. Me. Um, let's say that the person has only bullied one particular person, but they continue to do it to several people only mm -hmm. once. So they'll do it to this one, and then they do it to this one. And sure. Are they considered Bullying that would be a repeated act, even though you're even not. Even though you bet, you bet. If it's the same okay. sort of aggression or intimidation or you know any sort of, um, um, we look at something that they call in, in the literature um, a power differential. So if, if for some reason someone is exerting more power over you, be it in size, I mean that's kind of the old school, you know, back when you're on the playground and you have the big guy and the little guy and that, you know, the big guy was um, observed to be a bully. But there's also lots of other power differentials. So there is social status differentials of power, you know, so for example, if you are more popular than another student, if that is perceived to be the situation, then there is power in that status. And so it's us as an organization recognizing those differences and recognizing when a, a student may be in a power differential where they are perceived weaker in one situation, maybe socially, but then perceived stronger in another, maybe academically. So it is really an individualized thing. I think it's such a gift that we are who we are in Beach Grove. We are this small school corporation where we know our boys and girls, and therefore you can kind of pull out those individualized situations where you know, you're able to, um, you know, especially you know, our incredible administrative team can identify, you know, sort of uh, what's going on with our kiddos, um, with input from parents, and we can try to get to the bottom of some of these, these tough situations. And, you know, sometimes you get into gray areas where is it bullying or not? Well, no matter, these folks deal with the situation, right? I mean, they, they, they get to the bottom of what's going on and, and try, try their best to um, sort of uh, stop the cycle of this bullying that, that absolutely can take place. Um, so kind of as you scroll down, bullying is, um, so that, that bolded, unwanted, aggressive behavior that involves a real or perceived, and that's important, power imbalance. So if you are the bullied and you perceive that you are in a situation where you are in some sort of power imbalance, that's very real. It might not be kind of reality for someone else, but if you are experiencing it, that is absolutely validated. It is repeated or has the potential to be repeated. And again, it can be off school grounds, it can be after school hours. We're still responsible. 
There are other items that the Department of Ed has defined as not being bullied, and some of them are a little weird, but they, you know, clearly there were, you know, some reasons for why they needed to, you know, put some of these things down there. You know, exercising um, frequent speech. You know, sometimes uh, if the student is being very bad um, in their, you know, um, whatever their issue or their cause, you know, might be, that's not necessarily bullying. You know, they just might be passionate about a cause. Um, so, you know, some items that they kind of define as being is not. Some things to keep in mind. You know, it, what, what sort of history is going on between these individuals? You know, what's going on at home? Lots of times we get kind of stuff that's happening at home that rolls over into school, and then it becomes our issue. Um, but no matter, we, we have to be so aware, and we have to provide continual training in this area, um, because it's, it's just, it's a constant, and, and we have to stay up on the ways in which kids can communicate with each other. You know, I, I'm not this expert on the Snapchat thing, but my goodness, I guess this is a real deal that's going on. And, you know, that's showing my old 40, almost one years of age, you know, that I'm not, you know, kind of in that yet. And it's, but it's, I'm a school person. I need to know that, you know, and, and it's, it's something that we are always trying to stay up on um, to be able to target the stuff that's going on out there. Um, we feel really good about our implementation of these requirements. Um, uh, they actually were, were so well received as far as the way in which we were getting the word out on this stuff. Um, you might remember Dr. Keeley and I, you know, were actually interviewed, you know, by Southside Times as far as our <coughs> implementation efforts. We were perceived as being ahead of the game on this stuff. Um, but we absolutely don't turn our back and say, we rock, we checked off all of our requirements, we're good to go. It's a continuous thing for us. We, we keep, it, it's every day, it's all day. Um, and I can't thank this team enough for, for the work that they do to make sure, number one, that our boys and girls are safe at school every day. That's our ultimate responsibility. Some of the other pieces that are in your Dropbox that you know you might want to just check out, um, we included the um, actual law. Um, my computer might have gone to sleep. If you want to go to sleep yourself, you can read all those lawyer words, um, but it's there. Um, we've got some of the documentation. The buildings are going to go through some of the things that they're doing specifically. Um, this bullying curriculum. Oh, I got up there now. I stole it back. Oh, you stole it back. Well done. Okay, great. Um, oh, sorry, that's the high school. Um, there is a, um, this one, bullying activities. That's a PDF. That was um, uh, last year in order to kind of make our, um, our binder complete. We have all of our training information in here, and we'll just pass this around, all of our curriculum for each of our buildings. We decided to make a spreadsheet that just kind of compiled all the data that's in the binder. You have to have a copy of your curriculum at your district office, and that's what ours is. Um, so there's just a lot here, but I think it, it's probably instead of me talking, let's talk to the people that are the most important. Um, our buildings are prepared to give you an update on the specific activities that are going on in their buildings so that you're very aware of um, kind of strategically what's happening at the building level. So would it make sense if we just started at HP and had yeah. Mrs. Provost go? Can right. again, we, just a quick summary. Uh, again, the board can read Perfect. it. No, it's great. Again, Dr. Hammond, great introduction on that. And again, we take this very seriously. And, and I just want you to understand that, you know, we try our darnest to do it, but it's never enough. And, and again, for our parents that are watching at home is one bullying incident is too much, but we have to communicate and, and, and sometimes for a short period of time it makes it worse. And we have to get the law enforcement involved, but we can't solve it unless we have that continual persistence and just, you know, uh, kids got to come forward and talk to us about it. So, and Dr. So, Kaiser, can I say something real quick? Sure. I think since our parents watch this, as a Beach Grove resident and a taxpayer in Beach Grove, you know, we've got to be careful as adults, too, that we're not exhibiting that kind of negative behavior, especially on social media. Absolutely. Because our kids read that, and they see it, and if we're going to be that way on social media, they're, gonna, they're learning that from us. So as a community, I think we have to set the example and make sure that we're not exhibiting bullying behavior 
on social media, if we have a problem with someone, let's go and talk to them face to face. But let's don't put it out there where it's going to cause problems that escalate, and especially when both sides of the story are not there. Well, good evening. I'm Erin Probus, the principal at Hornet Park Elementary School. Um, I'm just going to take a quick minute to give you the scoop on what we do at Hornet Park to kind of lay that Truthfully, the honor of trying to grow honest, awesome people. Um, at Hornet Park, we get little five and six year olds. They're impressionable and precious, um, and we take that role very, very seriously. Um, so, really, what our, you may notice in our document, we've titled it Building Young People of Character. We have an honor that, and, a, and an opportunity that gets harder each year. Really set an example for them of how we want and how we should interact with our friends. As a matter of fact, if you've ever walked the halls of Hornet Park, staff refers to each student as friend. You might say, oh, hello, friend, where are you headed right now? And that's just to build the atmosphere of a family, um, of a community of friends and family, um, all trying to build each other up. So the, the document I've provided for you gives you a two-tiered approach that we have at Hornet Park. Um, one tier being preventative and proactive measures, so what we're trying to do to keep this from ever being a problem. And then regretfully, even at a young age, situations do surface from time to time, and so how well, we respond to those when they do come up. Um, at Hornet Park, our preventative, our proactive measure, the, the basis of that, aside from preparing staff to understand the law and our responsibilities, is to start teaching our children um, what it means to be a good friend. And we use the curriculum of bucket filling, and so, at Hornet Park, you might be called a bucket filler, and that's what we strive for, and that is to build each other up through the words that we say, whether that be in written, whether we're at Hornet Park, there's not a lot of extensive writing going on, um, but written and spoken word and deed, um, that we are using those things we do and say to build each other up or figuratively fill each other's bucket. So the concept is we all have an invisible bucket we carry with us, and the people around us are either filling our buckets or da, 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 dipping into our buckets. Um, and bullying type behavior would be those that are not building us up, that are unkind, disrespectful, or in sometimes bullying type behaviors. Um, and so that is referenced as bucket dipping. So we have a whole series of lessons that are presented to the children throughout the course of the year. Um, we have a wall of fame for those classes that become bucket dipping, or no, we don't celebrate that, <laughs> bucket filling classrooms. Um, so you will see at Hornet Park, children are carrying around little pingies, which are ping pong balls. And that's how they earn, um, that's a bucket filler. So if they do something kind or respectful or they're very courteous, they earn a pingy. And once their bucket is filled, they're considered a bucket filling classroom. Very primary, but incredibly appropriate. And um, it speaks very strongly to our students as well. So now at Hornet Park, it, it's more typically, um, if you're called a bad name, it's usually a bucket dipper. <laughs> so we're kind of eliminating some of those other terms. So those are some of our preventative and proactive measures and just trying to raise awesome kids. Um, and then we do have a very serious and uh, procedural response to if there is a measure of bullying. And I've outlined those for you there. And I will go through those briefly. Um, and I think that you know it's very similar to our responses in the other buildings as well. We receive that initial information and we conduct interviews and begin the processing. And we gather important information about who was involved, what type of misconduct it was, if it's recurring, as Dr. as Dr. Hammock explained, and if it affects the target's participation in school. We inform the parents of both the perpetrator and the target. Um, according to that very detailed definition provided to us, we determine if it was substantiated bullying or not. Um, in either case, we develop an appropriate response behaviorally, whether that's following the code of conduct, or just taking, as Dr. Hammock explained, that individual student situation into account and assigning um, hopefully the ideal consequence and response. And then we conduct a closing conference with the parents and um, make sure that we've documented everything appropriately and submit it to the state. Um, Hornet Park, a, a thing unique to Hornet Park, and it's probably at each building, I guess I just don't know, um, is at the end of the year we try to pass along any student who's exhibited those bullying type behaviors um, we send on to Mrs. Trudy Wolf and Mr. Craig Buckler at Central so that we can start to see are there patterns of behavior. Um, so just as a recap, Hornet Park is into preventing and being proactive, but we are very serious when there is a situation and we respond appropriately. So go be bucket fillers. Mm -hmm. Any questions? No.
good evening, everyone. And I guess I should just say ditto to Mrs. Probus. She put it really, really well, especially the responsive measures. It's very similar and central. And I did not outline that in the document that I gave. Um, I'm just going to highlight a couple things that are different at Central this year from what we've done before. Um, I believe not spring of 2013, 14, but spring of 2013, Mrs. Wolf, who is our um, homeschool advisor, was awarded a grant through the Education Foundation um, to participate in a program called Tools for Life, which is basically a character education building um, framework um, program. She did a pilot with that last year with one of her social skills groups, working on boys and girls really knowing how to interact with each other, uh, really focusing on uh, working with groups of students that had some really significant differences, and also with some boys and girls who have some social um, issues. It was such a success. She's rolled it out to the entire school. So at our back to school uh, professional de development days at the beginning of the year, all of the staff members went through a 40 minute um, session with the person who developed the program. She came to Central, um, she actually lives in Savannah now, came up to Central and spent 40 minutes in small groups, groups of eight or nine teachers, and each uh, staff member got that information. Mrs. Wolf really spearheads the preventative part of this. Um, she does character education, or now Tools for Life um, lessons, with every class, every Tuesday morning. She sees four classes, so you know it takes about a month to rotate through all nine classes and each of the grade levels, so she sees each group of students once a month and really does a focus lesson, and then communicates that to the staff and the teachers follow up on that um, in their rooms. Every day, at announcements, if you've been at Central in the morning, you've heard me say, today I pledge to respect myself, my peers, and the adults in my life, and we've added, and to do my personal best to become a better student. So every morning, that's through how we start our day, with that self-pledge, that reminder. We do newsletters. Um, Mrs. Wolf does the mix it up lunch. Um, but something that I just want to highlight quickly is the buddy bench. Um, hopefully you've been by Central and saw the relocation of the playground, which I think is just outstanding. And I think as we're talking about bullying and perhaps incidents that should not be taking place, the movement of the playground at Central has prevented some things that I think used to take place when it was down um, by the creek. So I think it's just phenomenal. Mr. Wagner, who's the physical education teacher, is going to be um, doing a lesson with all the students on the Be A Body. So we're going to have a bench put out of the playground. And it's only for boys and girls who feel like the boys and girls will all know if I see um, Dr. Hammock sitting on the bench, then someone of the you know 100 students that are out playing will then go and become that person's body. So we're building that in so that they're looking for um, people who need friends, but also if I'm someone who needs that buddy, I know where I can go to um, kind of get myself perhaps a new friend or make um, a new um, acquaintance or just be with somebody different for the day. I'm really proud of Central, uh, of the work that the students do and the staff do. Um, we are very open communication building. If you've been, well, I think everyone's been to my office, it's a long, the office is the front of the building. My back door is always open. I do something called good news visits and so in the morning as well. Um, I will announce I need to see these boys and girls at my back door for a good news visit. They line up, they get a certificate, a pencil, and a trip to the treasure, treasure chest. And many times those are boys and girls who are being recognized for perhaps something that they needed to improve on. And it's also a great way for boys and girls who continu continually and consistently are appropriate to be recognized as well. So those are just a few of the highlights of things that we do at Central. Craig, touch base very quickly on the lower playground. Now, now that you have this Taj Mahal on top of the hill, how's the lower playground? Doing? We talk about, um, we alternate weeks of playing up and playing down. So if you play up, you're on the equipment, and we don't allow, allow any playground um, balls or footballs or anything out there just for safety reasons. We don't want anything to go over the fence. And so one week, they play up on the equipment. The next week they play down, so they go back down to the blacktop and outside my office, um, outside the back door of my office, we have three big tubs filled with Nerf footballs, kickballs, jump ropes, all kinds of playground equipment that they carry down, and then they have one uh, week where they're just doing more uh, games. Mr. Wagner is teaching the boys and girls in physical education class games that they can then play um, outside um, on the playground. What it has done is it's eliminated having 200 
students in a confined area at once. We're not passing each other. Again, those of you who are familiar with Central, we had one way down and one way up, that staircase. And so it has just really been a phenomenal thing for us. So this week is the third grade plays up. They're on the playground. Mm -hmm. And second grade's playing down um, in the old blacktop area. But it has just been fantastic. I'm really, really pleased. It is beyond what we Brian talking with it. Uh, They'll read, it is far exceeded what I have hoped that would be. Other questions? But I think it's central. Good stuff. I'm Mrs. Reed, principal at South Grove Intermediate School. A few things you'll notice um, from South Grove um, we have started a new theme this year be a hero. And that's helping everyone respect others. Uh, so we have Superman standing in our foyer. And on Fridays, we've been dressing up like superheroes. And so we're just kind of just kind of doing a positive spin, helping everyone respect others. You also see at South Grove, we do a pledge each day, like they do at Central. Um, I'm hoping by the time they leave South Grove, they will have that memorized and uh, carry it with them forever. All students, fourth, fifth, and sixth graders are um, trained in Too Good for Violence. That is a universal violence prevention and character education program. We've done it for years. The teachers have it down. The children have a workbook. They work through. They learn how to say, I feel statements. Um, they learn uh, language like walk away, you know, just different things that as they go through South Grove, they'll remember that verbiage and they will you know, hopefully use it. And we remind them of those things office what could you have done I could have steered clear yes you could you know so it, it's a common language uh, at South Grove but it teaches conflict resolution anger management respect for self and others and effective communication and that is being taught right now in the first six weeks of school during success period every fourth fifth and sixth grader is getting uh, some form of too good for violence depending on their grade level Ms. Hackman, my assistant principal that is here this evening with me, and Mrs. Keeley, my home and school advisor, and, uh, and they have um, asked me to join them this year. We visit every single classroom, uh, probably starting next week, uh, and do a 30-minute, this is what bullying is, this is what teasing is, this is what reporting can do, and this is what you need to do to report, or these are your options for reporting. But it is, a, it is just a talk from, uh, it was the two of them last year, and the year before, a, a talk to the children. They also have to take a quiz, and, um, but just more general information on uh, bullying versus teasing and, and how to report uh, that at school. We have the Marion County Prosecutor's Office come into this at South Grove, fifth and sixth graders, to discuss social media and cyberbullying. And if you get a chance to come and listen to them, it is outstanding. Their presentation is outstanding. We work on that, uh, we get that set up with um, our school resource officer, Mark Parker. Um, I learned a lot um, and took a lot home to explain to my own two teenagers. So if, you, if you'd like to know more about that, I can let you know when we're gonna get that scheduled. It's usually um, in the winter, January or February. We have Hornet Heroes. That is a select group of children that, uh, two for each classroom, a boy and a girl, so when we get a new student, and we do get new students moving into each group every single day, it seems like, they kind of take them under their wing, show them, they give them a tour, they sit with them at lunch, they play with them at activity time, um, but just another way to help children feel more comfortable coming into South Grove as a new student. And they have an instant buddy. We like that. But um, as uh, Mrs. Provis said we do the same sort of format. If the bullying incident is reported to us, we investigate it to the fullest extent. We contact parents of both the victim and the bully. We work with the bully because we feel like that's part of what we have to do as well. We have to educate them, we have to educate their parents and work with them too because in the long run, we want to change their behavior. Um, but there are consequences that go along with, with that sort of uh, behavior at South Road. Um, but sometimes they get all three of us counseling them, Mrs. Keeley, Mrs. Hackman, and myself. Um, but we also teach children to be upstanders. And an upstander does not stand by and watch it go on. They report it. So when somebody reports a bullying incident or just a teasing incident or somebody not being nice, we celebrate that. 
Okay, this happened to be a phone call today. Your kid did the right thing. So we also praise and, and reward that upstanding uh, behavior. We also have a bullying box in the office uh, where students can report instances anonymously. So those are some things that we do at Sound Group. Any questions? Good evening. It is uh, nice to hear some common language that is, and some common themes that build throughout the, the lower grades and um, come to us. Uh, one of the things that we uh, do right off the bat is we have our student uh, handbook <coughs> meeting, and that always occurs on the second day uh, of the school year, and we open that up with a discussion and a definition about about bullying and what exactly bullying is. This year, uh, our entire student body will be trained in uh, two different ways. Our guidance counselor, which uh, Marie Shively started working on this last year, um, and with her transfer over to the high school, she's working with our, our new counselor, Lee Lux. They're going to push in, or Lee's going to push into social studies classrooms. Um, and we have four social studies teachers. She will uh, create a um, uh, bullying presentation, and we will train the whole uh, school for four days. Um, in addition to that, and on a different day, our integration specialist is going to apply a curriculum that she has developed on uh, not only web etiquette, but uh, cyberbullying, and she will push into social studies classrooms in a very similar way. Um, over the course of the year, um, students are not left uh, with just the, the one presentation or the other, they continue to get it. And if you understand the structure of our school, our um, students rotate through health, one, one, um, a quarter of them every four weeks, um, so, or every nine weeks. So over the course of the year, students are exposed yet again in health class to a bullying curriculum. Um, and that curriculum and those uh, partnerships between the guidance director, the integration specialist, and Mrs. Williams all stem from stopbullyingnow.gov, the uh, Indiana website, um, the voluminous amount of material and curriculum that was developed in the initial stages of this by Mrs. Ott. I think mm -hmm. Dr. Keeley can attest to that. Um, we initiated last year an anti-bullying club. This year it has the acronym NICE, Nursing, Intelligent, Caring, uh, and Esteem. And that club is sponsored by Mrs. Shirley Folks, who apparently, oh, there she is. Um, they spent a lot of time last year um, sending messages out in posters and, uh, and other things. And they also did a student-driven um, pledge against bullying that all of our teachers signed and our students and that was all um, in the cafeteria uh, throughout the year. Uh, we encourage all students to report, and we have uh, reporting inci uh, incident reports. We have Report It. We have our Safe Schools Hotline. Um, all of those reports, as Dr. Hammock talked about, can extend to social media and texting. Um, we have a bullying contract, and it's one of the ways um, Janice, that we keep track of, of situations that are not, that are one student, not over and over and over on the same student, but over the course of the year with different students. Um, again, as Tanya said, uh, part of that is parent notification to both the victim and the bully. Um, our staff are trained, we've already talked about that, uh, when they are aware on hall duty, they will intervene, they will monitor, they will counsel, and they will educate both the bully and the victim. Um, our staff does not deny ever anyone the opportunity to come and report. And one thing that I want to make clear, and one thing that is wrong on here, um, is this word right here. Bullying should not be there. Every report of everything, all the time, is investigated and 
follow that and causes a reaction by us. It has been that way since I was Dr. Hewitt's assistant every single day, every time we looked into it, every time. Um, it's been encouraged to continue to report. Um, our social studies teachers do a wonderful job of, of delivering cares to trade education. Part of that is um, uh, part of that is applying history to uh, to current day and, and students' individual lives. Of course, there are. Uh, the themes in language arts like the Dust Bowl, the Holocaust, the Outsiders, um, or seventh grade language arts is reading a book that's specific to differences between people and bullying. Um, eighth graders are exposed to general ethical and life skills in the FFA unit. Um, and of course, our classroom teachers daily um, discuss self respect, respecting others, respecting staff, respecting school. Um, and we are always uh, open and considering uh, school-wide guest speakers. This year we're going to have a young man named Matt Wilhelm. He is uh, a um, X-game biker, and the primary message for him is an anti-war message. That's kind of where we are right now at Beach Grove Middle School. And good evening, I'm Steve Todd, principal here at Detroit High School. And uh, there's a couple things I wanted to share with you before we get into our curriculum. Um, I think are really important. We've had a lot of changes at Detroit High School this year. We have 13 new employees, and I think that your position, I gave you all of the, the names and the uh, positions that people are teaching. And we have a new daily schedule that we never uh, that we haven't had uh, ever before. We implemented with activity blocks, success periods, and that's it for your position too. Uh, and we did that because we needed to have three months uh, for the number of students we have, with 19 or 916 students. Uh, one of the things that the cafeteria and uh, both Christy and Kelly have done a great job at is uh, we went from uh, 400, average of 400 meals a day, uh, to having 548, so we're up 148 lunches and we were a year ago per day, uh, and doing a great job. And most importantly, tomorrow night, we have back school night. Uh, it's at six o'clock. If anybody's interested in coming at five, uh, Karen Matthews and our, and our counselors are going to put on a, uh, a presentation on college uh, applications and, and scholarship opportunities, and that's at the media center at five o'clock. But then at six, we'll, we'll start the auditorium to back to school and like everybody's invited uh, to be there as well. Uh, the Cavaliers, you know, have been here for the last uh, week or so uh, at the high school, and that went very well. Uh, they ended up placing six in, in the world championships. And, we a lot of our students got to go see that as well on Friday night. Uh, they did a great job. And the, the uh, last thing before I get into the curriculum is Mr. Bradford and uh, uh, Mr. Bush and Mrs. Baker this summer uh, worked with Beach uh, Grove alumni and, uh, as well as community members and students from Greenwood and they put on uh, Dan Yankees. And it was brought, to, brought by the Beach uh, Theater Guild. And it's something we do every year. Uh, and so, on top of Mr. Bradford's trip that we, he spent numerous hours this summer at Pedro High School along with Mr. Bush and Mrs. Baker, putting uh, on the uh, presentation of Danny Angels. And I think it's something we do every year. We wanted a lot of people involved in what's going on in the community. Uh, also, this came to me, and I, I want to take a minute to read this because I think this is real important. Uh, last week, we were notified. Uh, of two of our FFA members, uh, Abby Scarlett and Brendan uh, uh, Parrott. They were selected to compete in the National FFA Convention in Agri-Science Heritage and Animal Systems. Uh, these two young ladies were recognized at the State FFA Convention this summer and uh, as state winners, and so they got invited to go to the National for review. Uh, so they took the top 15 agri-science experiments uh, and were invited to compete in the National uh, in Louisville, and I think these two ladies will represent each of the six schools in the high school very well. Also, last uh, at the state uh, convention, we had two other state uh, winners, George Roach and George Steve. They were winners in the Agri Science Fair Division of National Resources. Uh, their experiments uh, didn't get uh, hit to go to the national, but we had 
four state winners in our FFA program this summer. I think that's really important. Um, as we're talking about holding support curriculum, you know, I think what Dr. Kaiser uh, started with is there's never enough communication. We last got community more. But most importantly, what Dr. Hemming said, I think is really important. It is real to those students, that whether it's perception, bullying, <coughs> or it's an incident, it's real in their mind. And we have the duty and the responsibility to help them feel more comfortable and be able to get uh, in school in a safe environment where they're able to continue their education. That's a huge challenge. You've already heard what everybody's doing in the district, which is tremendous, uh, but it's never enough. At the high school, what we, we do, and we talked about the training of the staff, uh, we have a reporting documents just like everybody else does. Um, the policies are in the handbooks, we the administrative guidelines or our student handbook, uh, teacher handbooks. We have school safety specialists in our building. We have the uh, SRO officer that's involved in the intervention programs and investigation. Uh, we play to our students, uh, which will happen here in August, uh, this week or again next week, and one of our activity blocks is we do what's called Jeopardy Game. It's a Jeopardy Game that's based on bullying information. It's to teach our students what it is, what it isn't, and it's done by playing a game called Jeopardy, so the whole school is playing this game. Uh, then we also do an activity block. I go on TV and talk about just safe school practice. Steve, I just want to add to the group. We, uh, uh, Dr. Hammock's in the process of writing a safe haven grant. Mm -hmm. uh, currently, we have a grant that funds half of Dr. Dr. of uh, Mark Parker uh, uh, salary, which is a huge help. Uh, we've talked to the mayor. And we, uh, I've actually even met with city council on this topic, and there's not a lot of resources out there to expand Mark's role because we really feel when when Officer Parker steps up and starts talking to students, it's like EF Hutton listening. You know, they, they don't always listen to us as our suits and, and school people, but when you have a Beach Grove police officer, 
And, and one of the commitments we have with Chief Swartz and, and our mayor is, how can we have a, even a greater presence in, of, our, of our law enforcement, our school district? Not because we have crime in the district, but it's that prevention, it's that relationship building. And so that, you know, if they know Officer Parker or Officer Smith or Jones, and they see him in the school and they see him that one-on-one, -on -one, then when there's something going on in the street, they're going to be more likely to report it. So we met uh, this week with uh, Mark and Officer Parker and myself and uh, Steve Baird and Dr. Keeley, and we're in the process to see if we can't even have an enhanced presence on our school. The bottom line, Mark Parker can't be everywhere, and as good as he is and everything else. So as we tie into that, that safe haven grant, we're pretty confident we're going to achieve that. Uh, we, we think we're going to have an officer at the middle school more and more often. And they won't be there like Mark is full time. Uh, that's not feasible on our budget now, but long term, that's what we want to be. Uh, and again, I want to emphasize it's not like the biggest component of this is that relationship building we have with our kids. So they feel comfortable coming up and talking to Officer Parker or, or whoever we might have, or even more office uh, for the company principal. Uh, you know, unfortunately, many times it's our parents. But frankly, there are the issues. You know, they're 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 at home and their actions cause reactions of the kids. And then you try to get the parents. And recently, we tried to get a parent to come in to deal with a situation in middle school. The parent won't come in. So we've had to exclude the student until mom or dad come in. So you know, it's a whole it's a total team effort. Uh, you know, we're not perfect, and uh, we've made a lot of uh, strides. And, and I think as much as anything else, we've got a good program in place. But uh, we're moving forward, working with the Beach Grove Police Department, to even have that more street presence and making a difference in our community across the board. So we're, uh, again, uh, we uh, made some good strides, but you know, we're always looking to improve. Steve? The last thing I'd like to say, uh, we have the most school safety specialists in the state of Indiana in our school system, uh, and that's really a direct uh, relationship as well as the doctor people. Uh, what he's done, the training online for concerned because one child may be involved in something and another child is involved in something and one child doesn't get the same punishment as the other one. Could you sort of give us an idea of what ranks and punishment, suspensions and things like that, just so that parents would have an idea? Well, there's a, uh, I guess you could say a rubric uh, that the district has kind of guidelines that you go off of, uh, all the way from kindergarten to grade. Mm -hmm. uh, things in our handbook and I've had this discussion with both Carmen and Steve and Beach Grove's kind of unique in the standpoint if a student's in a fight traditionally they're, they're suspended for one day and I talked to Steve and Carmen I'm not I'm, I'm pretty confident I don't really believe that's enough and it's not that we're trying to punish kids but sometimes when a kid has a comp you know the kids they need a couple days of cooling down so uh, I talked to Carmen and, and Steve I'm going to come back at the next board meeting and ask to amend our policy on fighting to have one to really one to five days, you know. And, and here's an example: if it's uh, two kids that are kind of friends and horse around next to they start punching each other, you know. Five minutes later, I mean, I shouldn't have done that. You know, we handle that different than you know kids that are just just 
tackling and going after and that you know there's been agitated. I mean, there's different levels. I mean, we just had a we had an incident on Friday and you know, probably the, the student got one day, probably could should have might have got more than that. Or the other student got five days because of the racial slur they used. It, it's tough to explain to a parent where well, you got five, you got one. Well, one might have been not enough. And so I want to come back and ask the board because you approve those handbooks. So I just I feel more comfortable that and at the next meeting we'll ask we'll come with a more formal pro approach to to give the administrators you know I mean they could do it now but I, I think when it's in writing and it's an approved it's easier for the parents and you know fighting's a tough tough I've been at this in secondary ed now for a long time well over 30 years and the toughest thing is when you have a, a fight and the worst fight are girls I mean they're they're vicious they don't back off I've seen enough hair pulling and actually a wig was pulled off during one fight when I was principal and. The whole student body that was watching it fell down and started laughing. Uh, but but it, is a, it is really tough when you're trying to sort that out. And the tough thing is we can't share information. For example, in this situation, the parent wanted to see the video. Well, we can't show them the video because the rights of privacy of every other kid in that cafeteria, you know, we can't show it to the parent. We can talk about it, but they have no right to see that video. And if we show them that video, we could be sued. So, you know, and it's tough to, you know, we, I think we explained to the parent, Carmen, did, well, we can't show it to you. You know, we can't show parents, uh, we gotta be careful on bus videos, that, you know, even if, if it's one of your children that we're showing you, we gotta be careful even to show your own kid in that bus video, because there's other kids involved. You know, I, I, I'm not sure we have the ability to go in there and darken out and gray out everybody else, and you know, and so uh, there's a lot of areas that it's tough to communicate from that standpoint, but that is one change that, again, Carmen and I talked about that today, it gives them a little bit more flexibility, but. There's never a perfect disciplinary action. But I, I think on fighting, I think a minimum of two days in most cases just to cool down. Now, that's not as true at Hornet Park. If we got a couple kids throw down and throw their lunchbox down, I mean, you know. But when you get to middle school, high school, I, I think that's an adjustment we need to make in our policy. The other thing, Jen, is that the fighting, if you get a second fight, you're at school, school, and you had three in the last that you knew or something, that you could smell. And Steve talking, Carmen, Carmen, talk about what happens. Okay, so I get in a fight, you know, tomorrow over someone talked about my mama or my sister or whatever they might have talked about. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm out for, let's say it's two days. What has to happen before I can come back to school? You come in and have a parent uh, in your conference. The parent comes in with a student and talk to Mr. Hurley about the situation. We kind of go through uh, uh, what really happened and then also different strategies they can implement to uh, prevent the fight. At least the high school, uh, most of the fights are uh, uh, predetermined. People know about it ahead of time, and so you know, they can come in more off to if we know about it. We'll be helping our class, we'll be you know, stay by people, walk around with the building about 15 feet behind them, and prevent all kinds of things from happening as long as we know about it. And that's back to this communication piece. Uh, but normally, uh, you know, they, they don't come back until they have to read because in, in our policy is if you get a second fight, they don't want to hear. And so we want to make sure parents realize that up front. That that was okay. In my experience, the second fight rule is pretty traditional in most high schools. You know, second fight, you're normally expelled. And if it's a battery situation, I mean, when they're really going at it, they're handcuffed and they're taken down to Beach Road Police Department. You know, that, again, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's one punch and, it's, you know, Sometimes we don't do that, but if it's a Donnie Burke, we arrest them and take them down. And, and we really uh, rely on the uh, police officers because they come in and uh, uh, listen to what's going on on both sides. Uh, sometimes they, uh, uh, when they leave here, we don't know where they're going. Uh, a lot of that depends on their previous history or if they have some type of a record of some sort. Uh, they can go to Marion County lock up and it cost the parents a thousand dollars to get them out. Uh, they can go to Center, uh, or they go to the police station, or they'll, then they'll have 40 hours of community service. So there's three different options they can go and meet, but we don't determine that. That's done by the police department. So uh, you know, we, uh, last year, how many fights did we go? Four, seven, we had seven fights last year. Uh, now, we're not going to say there were more, but they were all down to park. Uh, or they went somewhere else. They didn't go on. I think what students have figured out is they don't go on any school property after school. Uh, whether they don't leave the high school, go to middle school, or South River, or they go somewhere else. And a lot of times you don't hear about it. Uh, but it's just not on school property. 
Any of our teachers have any feedback? You guys are in the hallways, and you guys know the efforts you guys put forth on this topic. You're speechless, I swear. I'm not Closing, you know, we're, we're far from perfect on this topic, but I think we put, put, a, put, a, put a pretty good plan in place. But it really comes down to parents communicating with us and kids communicating as often as possible. And sometimes, on the first initial, it gets worse. You know, you call a kid down and say, Hey, you got to stop doing this, and for the next day or two, it may get worse. And you know, we've, we've got a pretty hard nosed uh, process. And actually, Tom and I talked about uh, we're, we're at least at the secondary level, we're talking about exclusion on the first offense. In other words, you can't come back until mom or dad bring you back. You know, because until we get mom and dad involved, you know, even if you call them, we, sometimes we have to inconvenience the parents so they do something with their kids at home. And so we've we've had those discussions really in the last couple weeks, not just uh, recently, but you know, what else can we do? And once we get parents involved, we seem to have a little bit better impact. Uh, but sometimes when you meet certain individuals, you sometimes you know that impact is not going to be as successful so but uh, other comments or feedback it, it depends on if it keeps going so say that fight happened at the and the kids they any more drama back to high school so kids aren't still at each other or they it's just dropped if it doesn't come back to school and if it doesn't interrupt you know kind of the proceeding of the school day then it's not a school issue but if the kids come back if there was a group there or if, if the two that were involved keep at each other on the school property it's absolutely a school issue and to piggyback off that, my golden rule on, on fights on the way home, it's our business until the kids touch the front yard. You know, now, if they leave here and go down to the park, well, they, they've kind of got over jurisdiction, but if they're walking home and they get in a fight, you know, I don't have any problem disciplining that student, okay? But, you know, once they get home, they take off their coats and they go back out, hey, I'm going to go down to Johnny House. We really can't control that. We can only do the coaching and the and the uh, and trying to change your attitude when we hear about it, we come back and we do that. If we heard there was a fight going on, we'll call kids in on a preventative basis. But you know, once they're off campus, it's tough for us to totally control that. But there's that fine line on the way home. You know, we can discipline, uh, and there's been court cases to allow it to discipline if they're on the way home from school and it happens, or even if they step off and they're at the bus corner. You know, I've seen that they get off and throw the bags and they go at it. You know, treat it. My feeling, we discipline that. You know, if it happens half hour later after they've been home, well, there's that kind of that separation of time. I'm not sure we can discipline, but we can sure try to coach them up in that situation. Corporal punishment is still legal in Indiana. Yes, it is. <coughs> but you know what my feeling is on that? Some of our kids get beat at home. I'm not going to beat them at school. And uh, my, my previous school in Monroe, when I got there, they paddled kids. And I think there's better ways to discipline it. Even though my dad, being an IPD police officer, up until about 12, I I felt his belt a couple times, and that's not why I'm so wonderful today. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, but uh, we appreciate all the feedback on that. Okay. Well, should we just go into my kind of curriculum? Yes. Yep. Yeah, we'll do that. Okay. Um, I'll leave my kind of update here for a second. Um, the an item that is not in my update, but it's something that we've been working on here the last couple of days that we were excited to just kind of share with you and get your thoughts on. Um, we're taking another look at how we do our textbook <coughs> rental process here in the district. 
Um, we get that a very you know, large number that is sent to our parents, especially when you have more than one student in our school district, um, of, of a textbook rental um, is, it, it can really impact, you know, a family's budget. We have always tried to maintain our textbook rental at, at a level right now of about $150 um, to um, not, um, you know, harm our families, but to be able to remove at least a portion of what we are putting out as far as um, different software, different textbooks, really depends on the building. Um, this year, our textbook rental hit $150 for each student. Um, we are trying to look at ways to make that dollar amount not be as substantial. Um, one of our, our rationale uh, for that is that, you know, we as a district are, are starting to study and you know, clearly we have lots of students to make in this area, but, you know, whether or not um, a continued referendum situation for this district, you know, is, is uh, something that our community members will be thinking about. That could ultimately be something where um, a family might see an increase of nearly $50 to their bottom line um, with a continued referendum. What we would like to do in the district is kind of take a look at an area where we can uh, lessen the burden on our families, and that is through textbook rental, where we can eliminate some of the charges and, and um, kind of try to take on some of those charges ourselves and be able to kind of really specifically itemize each of our items. This is just an example of, of the whole thing regarding the first grade would look like um, with a grand total to our families of $100. So um, if you have a family of two or three, you would look at a savings of, if you have three of those, $150. Um, we're trying to be very specific in the exact dollar amount that is actually assessed for students for items that we are charging. Um, for example, at, at Corner Park this year, we had a brand new language arts series, a, a brand new language arts adoption, books, workbooks, material, hands-on things that the boys and girls are using at the one level. If we are able to kind of look out over the course of a five-year implementation of textbook for K-1, the um, a dollar amount assessment that we feel is fair of 1487 over the course of the lifetime of all of which girls will be using those books, we feel like that's a fair assessment. So when you kind of get to that bottom line of 100, that we feel is a lot more palatable to a family and it's a lot more real um, as far as, you know, specific dollar amounts for what we're charging. If you kind of scroll down a little bit, we want to also be very open with our families um, on our textbook rental form now and just include our supply um, recommendations on that list. Um, we have some great feedback this year. Um, we all know that there are supplies that boys and girls need in order to be successful students for their school day. I mean, that's just that, that's been a reality ever since we were all in school. Um, things like pencils and travel notebooks and glue sticks and having a plastic storage box to put your things in. Um, these are all items that our boys and girls absolutely need to be successful. When you get to run out to Target or Walmart and you know get those things to start out the fresh school year, I used to. I think I was destined to be a teacher because I love the smell of those things. <laughs> um, so you know, new stuff was always just so great. Um, but we also recognize and, and you know we tried a couple things this year that you know may have been too much of a burden to ask on our families. So we want to instead of you know kind of um, requesting in a supply list that is um, sort of uh, required. We want to just now kind of um, pass along to our families things for the classroom that would be helpful as far as donations. So some items like dry erase markers, um, cleaning wipes, and things that were actually on the supply list as you know kind of requirements. Um, we feel some families might be able to go out and because it's a good year for their family buy five packs of dry erase markers for the school for the, school, for the classroom, whereas another family couldn't possibly do that this year. We understand that. So. Just kind of listing out for those grade levels what those helpful donations would be. Um, and then uh, the building leaders can distribute those other items, you know, um, to be fair across the board. So just something that we're thinking about um, and certainly would love your feedback on, you know, as, as we're moving forward, nothing has been decided, but, you know, we would, you know, kind of go through and analyze and, and really 
try to stick to that $100 level for all of our grade levels. Um, this, this K-1 was just an example for you tonight. And I want to piggyback off that. First of all, I want to thank Tammy for really bringing this topic up in our last work session. And we, we had done this in the past at the previous school district I was at where you look at the list and as she said, well, some are helpful donations. People are going to feel a lot more comfortable, as she said, well, this is a donation, but this year I can't, I can't solve it. And, and what I want to emphasize and clarify is, you know, this right here is dependent on us passing our transportation, uh, our technology, or we, you know, our referendum was on transportation, technology, and, you know, uh, maintenance of our buildings. You know, that's up again. That's 35 cents. That is no tax increase. Absolutely no tax increase on that. So if we're able to win that, which I'm confident our, our community will support that, we can drop textbook rental down $100. You know, because some of the things that we're taking through textbook rental, we can now take through capital projects if we're able to sustain that. Again, that's a no tax increase. And then we can talk about where we want to go there with the second question, et cetera, et cetera. But again, winning the referendum on, on, on uh, May 5th will allow us to drop this and, and be more successful. So again, that came up, and we wanted to get right on that and give you some feedback. And, you know, we can even go back and look at the, the list on the recommend and say, okay, do we really want to put hand sanitizer as a donation or a box of Kleenex? I mean, yeah, those are a couple of things, but these are other things. And one thing that came up, and I don't know if it was through our uh, web page, I mean, why are we using a, a one fine point black Sharpie marker? Well, I had no idea. So we did an in-depth investigation, and it was that, that art teacher we had at Hornet Park and Central, and she used it for art class. Mm -hmm. And I think, Tammy, I think you maybe spoke up or and helped, I had no idea. You know, I don't have a, a kindergarten kid. So, yeah. you know, I think it's important that we're, we're real clear with this. And we put this out and put it on the web page, but we think this will be a good direction. Any feedback? Thoughts? People always like to see things go down. Yeah. So we're, we're optimistic we could move this direction. If, uh, so. I only had a couple more items. Um, uh, in my update, um, which is in your, your board packet, we, um, I think you guys know that we always like to start our meetings in our district with success stories. And one of the ways that we um, started our district-wide meeting when everybody came back to school, Beth, you were here, so this is a repeat for you. Um, thanks for being here, by the way. Um, we started um, our presentation with some success stories, some things that we wanted to share with our staff um, that we thought that you all would, would just have an interest in the, the, the great data that we were sharing um, with our team. You guys are a part of that. Um, and we've got some great things to celebrate tonight. Uh, first off, you know, it is amazing. Beach Cup High School boasts a graduation rate of 93%. That is phenomenal. 98%, 90% was our goal, and we surpassed that at 93. One of the primary reasons for that graduation rate of 93%, in addition to the wonderful things that are happening at the high school, is the fact that we have the Hornet Richmond Academy. The Hornet Richmond Academy, as you all know, there when the, the graduation took place. They graduated 23 students in May and were able over the summer to add an additional five students for a sum total of 28 students who graduated from Beach Grove High School via the Hornet Christian Academy. So um, this is just incredible. Both that's 28 students who we feel would not have graduated without that program. It's just phenomenal. We, we can't say enough about the great things that are going on out there. Um, we do have up updated ITEP scores. They just were released about a week ago. Um, our data is impressive. We can continue our trend. I, I ran the numbers today just to make sure. Um, friends, we are still in the top three as far as highest achieving districts in Marion County for mathematics. We are in the third spot there. Second to, and in language arts, we are tied for second place with Seaway, Franklin Township took first place for English language arts. Now, that's amazing. But we also, what makes it even more amazing is the fact that we also ran today just to make sure the free and reduced poverty rate for districts in Marion County. We are the separate IPS, of course, is the number one district for poverty for, for Marion County. We are in third place, 
to Wayne Township and to Warren Township after IPS. So IPS, Wayne Township, Warren Township, and us as far as most poverty rate um, free and reduced for Marion County. Friends, we are in the top three of the districts in Marion County. Warren Township, this is not to by any means, you know, be disrespectful to these districts, but Warren Township, Wayne Township, and IPS are the three bottom performing districts in, the, in Marion County. So you would expect, based on data, that Beach Grove would be fourth from the bottom. We are second or third from the top. It's phenomenal, and it is absolutely a result of these educators that are in the audience tonight who do wonderful work at the middle school as well as our incredible folks in all of our other buildings. I, I want to do a more involved, you know, presentation like you were, you're used to from Mr. Collins, you know, giving you data and statistics about ISTEP. But for tonight, I knew that our agenda was long. But I just wanted to visually impress to you, you know, kind of where we are, uh, grade level. Oh, nuts! I thought that my. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's in your. It's in your. Um, your packet. So I just visually showed you, you know, in yellow. Um, those grade levels where we are, are above average, well above state average. Um, that's, of course, always where we're trying. 90% is our goal for every grade level, so we're not there. Um, but boy, are we close. And, and goodness gracious, we take these sweet babies who come to us with such gaps in some cases and get them to where they need to be. And it's everybody working together in a safe and secure environment. That's a critical component to this. Um, where they feel like they can learn, and then they do. So that's really exciting stuff. The, I, just a couple other items. Um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of an update on all the boys and girls that we touched over the summer. Um, at Central, Mr. Buckler hosted 50 kindergarten and first grade students, 75 second and third grade students for summer remediation. Those third graders, as you know, take that I read three test at the end of their experience. Wonderful results there. Um, Mr. Buckler was really proud of the work that was done at Central. He led that whole program, and I'm really grateful to him for that. Um, students at South Grove Middle School um, took their summer programming at the middle school. Mrs. Salas led that program to kind of support Buzz Club activities. We had nearly 70 students participate in that. And then you all know that we had those summer sports camps going for our kiddos. We had 100 students participate. Um, Mr. Ryan Morgan, who was in the audience, really led that initiative for us. And so we had kiddos who were being exposed to lifelong fitness activities that you just might not get in a PE class, golf, you know, things that are just super fun um, and maybe the kids don't have the exposure to. 100 of our kiddos were able to experience that this summer. So just great stuff going on all summer long. Great stuff to report. Any questions? Do you know what the percentage of that free reduced lunch is now? I do. Uh, for just uh, Beach Grove? Yes. Yes. So um, Beach Grove as a district, and so, but I could give you building as stuff too, as a district is 67%. Matter of comparison, IPS is 82, Wayne is 76, Warren is 71, and then us at 67. I guess we've actually gone down a little bit. Yeah, just a tad. Yeah. Now yeah. keep in mind but that some of our schools certain have buildings actually are over 70. Yeah. And what ha it happens at all high school, high school kids will fill out the forms. It's not cool. And so you always drop across the board, it's, uh, you drop at the high school. But uh, again, you know, uh, we can give you more of the data on where they're on the schools. But last year at Horner Park and Central, we were hovering around 7%. Uh, South Dover Middle School was a little lower than that. But uh, okay. high school kind of dri drives that average down across the board. Uh, and again, I mentioned before, Dr. Keely and our, our spare time, we did a, uh, our, our doctoral thesis was on a study of looking at schools and how they overcame achievement. And Beach Grove was in the top 10 in the state at achieving above that in our test scores. And uh, he's not here tonight, but hopefully he'll be watching at home. But I give so much of that to Kit Collins, uh, what he did over the years, and especially when he started the eight-step process, which is the foundation for instructional model. So. Uh, you know, it's we've had a lot of great people, Dr. Show Walter, Dr. Sayer, and, and really building that tradition. It just didn't happen overnight. And again, great support from our parents. So. Dr. Hammond, can you also give us a breakout? You have to do it now between um, free and reduced lunch from transfer versus lives in Beach Grove. Yeah. Yeah. Just interested to see that. Yeah. 
And I have a quick question, and if you don't have the answer, then I understand because I didn't think about it for just a little while ago. Summer servings, was that a successful program this year? Yes, absolutely. Thank you for, thank you for, I should have, I should have put that in, in this report. Thanks for bringing that up. Absolutely. Yes, great. Um, we had summer servings happening at Hornet Park, at Central, and at the middle school. Um, we were able to serve all the boys and girls who were attending our remediation program, and um, uh, it was um, shared with me um, through Mrs. Deal that the most community traffic was at Hornet Park. So, um, of community folks coming in and out. So, yeah, those sites were busy, and, and I don't have the grand total, but I could get that for you That's as far great. as meals served. Right. Because I think that would be great data. Yeah. My second question is, is do we know or will it be determined later, are all district-wide children eligible for the free breakfast again this year? Or has that not been determined yet? <coughs> when that last, when the case last year? I you did not I'm qualify. Um, I'm not sure the high school high school, did not. high school did not qualify so it, it goes by site um, and so um, I think with the improvement our percentage went down I think that it'll probably lay right at the same so middle school and down as universal breakfast but they However, if, as long as they were under 18 they could yeah summer helping they could summer, summer helping yeah summer, summer, yeah, summer, summer yeah. no questions asked yeah. yeah but then at the high school you, you know anybody it's not universal but then um, the breakfast is served every day right. and it's available and um, it is good I mean, they do have good options now so 70% um, of our you know, or 50% of our high school kids could go and meet that degree. Okay. one thing we've talked a little bit about is some high schools are going to an after school snack for your athletes through the summer through the, the, the federal schools. program so that's something we talked about so a lot of the kids are running the Taco Bell and everybody sells real quick even before practice and you know we haven't got to that point but we, we talked about it as an option. Good question. Uh, yeah, I'll give answers on all that for you. Thank you. Thank you. Melody. Oh. I'm going to be quick because I know we're running late so you can read it in the report. Lots of great things happening because of all these guys out here and I get the pleasure of being able to report them. So really good things. The only new thing that's not on your report that I gave you uh, earlier that's changed since then, um, which a lot of these guys out here are going to be happy to know, but the Beach Grove Education Foundation Board uh, just re-upped its Donors Choose $10,000 commitment for this year. So our teachers can start writing those grants and get matched. So I know you guys like that. <laughs> so I just wanted to add that. But other than that, that's, it's in your report for you to read. Um, quickly, we need to make a motion to approve the minutes of the July 8th meeting. I'll motion to approve the minutes. Tammy, hold second, please. I'll second that. Tim, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And we need to make a motion to approve the claims for July and August. Motion to approve. Rick, hold second, please. I'll so second. Moved. Nancy, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, Dr. Keeley. For the business update, I didn't give you a formal one because I've been kind of uh, <clears throat> immersed in the budget. So that is kind of the report, is that I did provide to you a budget calendar of all the legal requirements and activities that have been transpiring and will transpire in the next three months. Um, by law, the uh, advertisement will go out um, prior to the budget, um, or the budget hearing that will happen in September's board meeting, September 6th. And then on October 7th will be the official adoption um, of that budget. So next board meeting, I'll have a PowerPoint for you and I'll go through um, quite a few things, uh, be able to answer any of your questions, but PowerPoint I'll give to you well in advance so that you can look at all the funds and I, I, I'm sure all the terminology and all the numbers will kind of rush right back and we'll have a joyous event. Be good. <laughs> Okay. So personnel, uh, I sent you uh, just basically the uh, document that we used to approve. The majority of people on there were um, staff members, certified staff members, teachers that were starting the new year. Um, we did get a document also that has new staff members um, from our high school um, with their names there, some of which were transfers and curriculum changes that we've had uh, around the district. Um, other than that, we've been working diligently on the ECA and the coaching and all, all of those things to get started. Shortly here, I'll have all the teachers' contracts ready for signature. <laughs> so you can get your 
fingers warmed up for that because that takes quite a bit of time. So, um, and then I'll have an approval time in September, but I think I may ask for um, review and signature prior to that, so that I can get the contracts out. Um, with that being said, um, so you'd like a motion to approve those employment right? recommendations? Mm -hmm. So moved. So I'll second that. Tim, all in favor? Uh, Aye. Opposed? I uploaded a document of called <coughs> a uniform conflict of interest disclosure. It's not allowed by state law to have um, a school board member who had a uh, sibling uh, employed uh, in the district unless. You make it well known and documented, and then I file that report on your behalf. So it's been filled out and it's ready for signature. So uh, there needs to be an approval of that so that we can have the signature um, on there and then file appropriately. And it's it's for me. So yeah, move. Because my daughter works in front of the corner park. Down there, you said for a bit. Tammy, all in favor? Uh, Aye. Opposed? By, and by law, that will be filed with the State Board of Accounts so that the next time we have an audit, that's an obvious no-no. And so as far as just, you know, just speak up and be transparent, and that's really all that is. So, um, that's it? Yep. I'll be yes. um, Well, I'll lead off. Uh, Brian Tom and Michael. Uh, I know he's really upset that this is his last board meeting. Uh, what's amazing about Brian, uh, he's been a Hornet for many, many years mm -hmm. and will continue to be a Hornet in, in many ways since his wife now works for us Yay. Uh, and doing a great job working with uh, Laura and, and Amy. But, you know, Brian came on board three and a half years ago. And, and Brian's history, while he was going to IUPI getting his degree in accounting and finance, he uh, worked on our grounds crew. And what's really great, he knows every hiding place. <laughs> or any place those summer guys can hang out, he knows it. But no, in all serious, he has done a fabulous job. I tell people all the time, between what Tom and Brian has done to make us more efficient and save dollars, and equally as important to save operation time, has been fabulous. And Brian is the new business manager at Mountain Vernon Schools, uh, where he lives, and we just wish him the best of luck. And he's not getting away from us. We'll see him at all the conferences and all the things like that, and, but he has just done a fabulous job for us. So, uh, you know, Brian, my, my hat's off to you. What a great, great job you did. And the impact you've had on a school corporation in a very short window of time has been fabulous. We are not going to officially fill his position short term. Uh, we've got some plans we'll come back and talk to the board about on how we think we can fill those duties and maybe enhance some other areas of the district where we think uh, we'll uh, need some, some tweaking with. But we'll, Come back to the next board meeting and talk about that. So our best wishes to mm -hmm. Brian. Let's give him a round of applause. Hey. And if it's okay, Brian, why don't you give me a report and then turn it back over to me. We're going to talk about enrollment and capacity and, and get some good information out with that. Um, the only thing I wanted to talk about is the sign at 13th and Main. We finally, after a year, got our building permit approved. So hopefully by the end of the year, kind of sad I have to give it up because it's one of the most enjoyable things ever. So uh, it should be going up. little tiny name on the corner. Yeah, yeah. I'll make sure I sign the inside of it. Um, so it should be going up. IMCU, as we, far as we know, is still planning on paying for half. <coughs> so hopefully by the end of the year, it's all done. You know, the RDC would like to contribute to that sign as well. I don't know how much, but they do want to contribute. So maybe that should be your final act as you contact the president and see what they'd like to do. And I have his contact information. Okay. So yeah, so hopefully that will be going up and be a good thing. That's great. Well, and I, it, it's such a, it's really interesting. I've been here for seven years. All I hear about is, why is that darn sign not repaired? Well, you know, we, we quite frankly, we didn't want to spend the money, but, you know, we did. We saved up and have some money to finally get it done. It is truly a communication tool for our community to see that. And I think everybody's going to be pleased when it, it rises from the ashes and <laughs> becomes, you know, an integral part of our, really our communication plan for the entire uh, city of Beach Grove. So. I'll add to that too, as to explain why it's still up, because if we take the poles down, then that changes the whole complexity of the building permit. So let's stay in there until we can reflect the problem. That's why we've left it there. I love the mosquito on it, but it's time to put a real warning <laughs> on the sign, so. For any other, other no, that's it. I, I'd like to invite uh, Eileen McManus to come to the podium. Uh, she is truly, uh, Melody is our chief recruiting officer. 
uh, and Eileen is our statistician. Mm -hmm. And I've asked her to come tonight, uh, walking down History Lane, uh, in 2008, June 1st, uh, I was fortunate to start my first day as superintendent. And during that period of time, the law changed on how we budget schools. And what it did, it, it allowed us to accept transfer students in an easier fashion that would financially help the district. You know, people say, well, why do you take transfer kids? <coughs> Very simple, it's for the money. You know, transfer kids bring over $3.5 million to our school corporation to help us keep our elementary art, phys ed, technology, uh, and, and other curriculum. You know, it's been, in music, it's been critical. It's helped fund our agri-science program at the high school. It's brought back our TV studio that was was really out of commission. Uh, so the, the reason we take transfer kids because it funds programs for all the kids who come to Beach Grove. Once once you come to Beach Grove, you're a hornet. Uh, and so what I want what I lean to do is kind of explain. I've got kind of our capacity chart. This is the Bible that Eileen and I keep together, along with what Robin does with uh, a separate attendance and enrollment chart. We track this on a weekly basis. So, I mean, maybe just talk about the general process and, and thank you for staying tonight and, and giving us your insights. Um, basically, we follow the policy of the board as the government of the state law change. And we had to decide where our cutoff date was to take the students to go to the lottery process. And that date was July 3rd of this past summer, and we took a lottery in July 11th. Our second year of a lottery. But what you might not realize is we start taking names, taking names for students of the 2014 15 school year back in 2015 school year. And so we had to have a process of keeping those names. So we kept those names in an application that, that's approved by you all that um, the parents had to fill out a certain criteria they had to get to us and stay on top of that criteria because what was good and December 2013 might not be good in May of 2014. So we had to stay up on that. And when we went to, to July 3rd, we knew we had, and I have numbers here, like you said, approximately 241 students that wanted to come to Beach Road. Out of those 241, some of them were siblings, because the rule is if, you, if you're here and you have a sibling, you can come in. Um, so a lot of those were kindergartners. Now we, I mean, that was a big chunk. But we still had a lot of people knocking on our door saying when, 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 when. So July 3rd, cut off. These are the people by grade that had to go into the lottery. July 11th, and they had to have that, and they had to have certain papers that went with it. And they did, we had parents, they, they, they wanted it to be true, and they complied. And some people was, you know, no thank you, we followed the process. Well, July 11th, we had our lottery. Well, we had only two parents that showed up but they were all there in spirit. <laughs> because the phone rang every day after that asking, what number am I? And we sent out letters, but they wanted to know right then. No, when are we getting in, when are we getting in? So out of those 241, some dropped off. Um, a lot moved into the district because they realized, well, I'll bypass the lottery and I'll go get an apartment. I'll go get a house. I'll move into Beach Grove. They wanted to be here. Um, and that was a way they could assure that they could be. So if you own oh, property and you're renting it right now, you are a gold mine because people want to be broke. And, and this is what we found out. The people that couldn't move into Beach Grove for one reason or another, a lot of it I found was that it was grandparents and aunts and uncles that were taking custody of children, and they lived outside the district. They didn't think there were going to be school-age parents in there. So it wasn't a thought to them, oh, I just live right outside Beach Grove. Now they're in a situation, and then IPS did redistricting, and they didn't want their children or their grandchildren to go to a different staff school. So we have a lot of people with different circumstances that we've never had. We also knew that in the past five years, at Christmas time, the semester break, there's about an 18% of attrition rate. They move on the donut, and they go to the next district. Maybe. You know, they move out, they rent, they get to where they move out, and they go around 465. I come into the last five years over the summer, and it was usually about 25 percent. You know, take it into rough numbers. We didn't have that this year. Those, those people aren't moving out; they're staying. Um, that that was a shock to me. Anyway. So our numbers right now, we 
we started at 241 for the lottery. We were able to get a lot of kids in. We're at 91 right now that want to come in. And I get phone calls like this. They, um, yeah, and I'm going to jump stop right there. Right here in the corner, and again, this number is a little, I have 93. Well, it's because there's two 11th graders, I correct, they did get in there. They got okay. in. Yeah. And so, so, so right now we're we're not 100 percent at capacity, but we kind of shut the door. And, and the reason is because we've had such a huge influx of Beach Grove residents. And we can get more details on this because you know people say, well, why, 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 you know, why classes got so large? They've gotten large because either Beach Grove residents didn't register, register, or they were registered and didn't show. I mean, there's a lot of different reasons. But we'll, I want to go through the uh, the facts in more detail. Uh, but right now we have 91. Uh, 91 and 91, 42 are from the original lottery. Anyone that came knocked on our door after July 3rd at 5 p.m., he said we were to miss that one fast. Um, and they still came. We still have 49, what I called after lottery. So that's, that's and, and, and so as, as we go through it, if we see some attrition and numbers go down, which they will, we can come back probably at the semester. You know, invite them to come in because we do lose kids at the semester. We've done it traditionally, but just to point out, you know, we track that. Eileen, we, we track it, and Robin takes the enrollment on a weekly basis. I think we're going to be two weeks this year, Robin, and we track that. So before, if someone calls up, well, can I get in? Well, right now, you you're not getting in because you got 93 people in front of you. It depends on the grade level. We've got we could let juniors and seniors in, but we're kind of holding pattern. We just we just decided this week to stop and catch our breath because we will still have Beach Grove kids that have not been in school that been in Beach Grove that will show up this week and next week. They show up all the way up until Labor Day. So we'll kind of put on a whole pattern. Labor Day is a big thing. It's, I mean, I grew up in school off Labor Day, but I grew up a long time ago. So I don't know when that process stopped that you didn't go up after Labor Day, but you guys know. I, mean, I know you guys have them every day walking in. I had two phone calls today. I have a kindergartner. We're ready to go to school. And my initial, because I think transfers, oh, do you live outside the district? Well, no, I live right here. I live here. But they had thought that they should be in school yet. Um, we send out letters. Don't think we don't communicate with them. We send out. We send out. But even our lottery parents, we knew when we got when we drew those numbers, they had a letter out in the mail that day. We communicated with them. We also explained to them that this is, we want you here, but. Get your kids enrolled because that's the first row. Get them enrolled in your homeschool. We called you. I had three notes. Robin helped me make phone calls. It was like a, it was like a lottery for us. Like, why don't we make sure kids in? A couple weeks ago, and she and I were making phone calls. And we had a few notes because, especially with the younger kids, it's harder to transition for them. The middle school parents and the high school parents were, yes, call me anytime. Call me in May. I'm so good. So. What are the two ADA dates? Uh, it is September 12th yeah. and February 5th this year. And, and that's what the key is, that basically we're going to be funded, we're going to back fund to July 1st. Okay, so basically we could give them an estimate budget based on enrollment. So we give that DOE, we just kind of stay neutral. And so they, our funding, which started in July, was based on anticipated enrollment that we gave and so that will stay steady and then after the 12th when we get to november and december they will adjust that up or down luckily it's going to be adjusted up and i can share that data with you then the same thing happens again when you get to uh you know january 1st then that six month is gone now you're on a new six month budget based on a february date so that when you come to uh, uh normally april and may they'll adjust this up or down based on what your role it is and, and that's why the enrichment academy was so important. We were losing kids that were dropping out. We had to do something, not just graduation rate. Uh, and so, you know, it, it will, it varies. You know, but those are the two dates. Uh, and I could, Tom and I teach the budget class in the state. We could give you a long history of all that, but really put you to sleep. But it's really quite frank, it's the fairest way school funding has ever been because the money follows the child. So if a kid lives in Beach Grove and they go to the Met Charter School, uh, that's ran by Scott Best, a former Beach Grove teacher. Uh, that money follows that kid, and so it, it's much, you know, it's a much fairer way to do it. And yes, there. 
I can go through that here in a second. Great, great lay down. Uh, a couple things. First of all, uh, we set our capacity based on sections. And again, if you this one, see that column going out there, that's teacher sections. Uh, so we're able with our classroom space to have nine kindergarten teachers and first grade teachers. Okay. So based on a capacity, uh, our capacity is column E, and that's that's a capacity we've looked at. So with a capacity of 235 kids, that's an average of 26.1 for kindergarten in, in that grade level. And based on our current enrollment over here of 234 and 232, we're pretty much at our capacity. Okay? So here's the actual average of where we are today. That's just truly as of this afternoon, Robin got me those numbers. And so we're shooting for 26.1, 26.1, we're pretty close to that. How that capacity can change is, okay, so we're not taking transfer kids as of right now. Again, I, I say the end is full and we're stopped. The problem is, you know, we may have five Beach Grove kids move in next week, especially at kindergarten and first grade. You know, it, it's amazing to me with, you know, all the back to school sales that are on TV that people don't realize school is starting. Uh, we'll even have high school kids that show up in a week that were here last year. So, so it really, it varies grade level to grade level section. Uh, Central, same thing. We have nine teachers for grade level. And what happened is some of our parents were really concerned about Central, the class size, but we had two transition classes. So if you're saying, well, that, that class size at Central is really large. Well, it was for the first week and a half because we had two teachers that did not have a full house yet. We identified kids based on their reading level, and then this week we created that ninth section. And, and Craig did a really good job. He said he put letters in the, uh, uh, the enrollment information. We sent letters home to everybody, but yet parents sometimes don't read that and say, well, I'm at a class of 31. Well, or my kid's sitting on the heater or whatever that might be or those things. Well, we communicated with central parents that, that was going to be short term. So as of now, we, we balanced that out. And so our actual size is 27 to 25. Now, I would love to have a class size of 20 to 22. I, outside of Speedway, I don't know of any school in the state of Indiana that's not 24, 25. So, questions on that? Well, I do have So, we basically, as a board and with the administrators and all, have decided what we think a capacity average is for right. each classroom. So, let's say we go through another three more weeks or whatever, and we get another 10 more kids that live in Beach Grove. Right. And they're all in the same grade. Right. And all of a sudden, one at the couple of classrooms are 35 students. Right. What happens? We, we have a plan for that. Uh, basically, what we'll do, we've told our teacher, we'll call hire a teaching assistant. Yeah. You know, hopefully some with a college degree. We have those out there. And we'll put that person full-time in that class. We would probably, let's say we had 10 kids. We'd probably put five and five and hire teaching assistants to go in there so yeah you really break it down to you know maybe a 15 to 1 ratio but doesn't it get to the point where the room's so small and there's absolutely. not enough room for absolutely. the kids to enjoy their learning experience so then what do you do uh well we're do not you eventually tell a transfer student you can't go anymore with your phone you know uh we haven't done that uh the good the good and the bad thing normally we have enough attri attri attrition out that we don't get in that situation it's amazing that you know, we, the number of kids we have coming in, the number of kids coming out, the exception of that is ninth grade this year. We had 30 Beach Grove ninth graders move in, really, since uh, close to when school, well, right before school started. And we'd already set and taken a few transfer kids. We took very few transferred ninth grade kids. And we st and that was just the attrition from last year coming forward, because we, we had a 250 in the eighth grade. Most of those kids came back, and we had a bunch of ninth graders move in. And, you know, that's been a, a normally for us in, in half the ninth grade. Uh, you know, we could, we could uh, artificially set our capacity at 230 in these grade levels, knowing that, you know, they may uh, drift to, to 235 based on that. So we could always go back and set our, our transfer capacity at 230, knowing that we're going to have some overflow. I mean, there's different things we can do to adjust that. Uh, you know, we have to remember if we do that, we're going to lose some funding, and that's okay as long as we can plan for it. So, uh, so, so you look at Central and Hornet Park. You know, right now Hornet Park. Now, I don't know how many showed up today, but we're two kids greater here in Column Nine. We have two more kids at Hornet Park today compared to last spring. I did not compare fall to fall. I went fall to spring because that's what our funding's based on. 
And so uh, on our capacity, we could take six kids, but we're not. And that's the yellow box there. At Central, we're up at 11 compared to last spring. Uh, and we, you know, again, on paper, we have more capacity, but we really don't. Really kind of based on what you said, you know, we'll have Beach Grove kids that still show up. It's just, it's just the reality of it. Now, the South Grove is a little bit different. We only have eight sections of teachers there, and that's strictly because of classroom space. You know, if we had more classrooms available, we're not going to go build new classrooms. We won't, we're not going to do that. So that capacity level is a little bit lower at 220, and that's strictly because we have eight sections. And so that gets our class size 25, 26. I would love for all the class size to be under 25, but realistically, in today's fiscal market, that, you know, schools just don't do that. So that's, so South Grove, you'll see the class size is the same. Uh, we've got a few less numbers uh, at those grade levels, but we're up 20 over last spring. Any questions on it? It shows the capacity of, of 30 more, but I don't feel comfortable. Really, I look at the class average, you know, 25, 6, 25 26, 27. We don't want to be above that. You know, I, I taught classrooms of 31 and 32, but I taught accounting into a business. That's a lot different than an elementary teacher with that many kids. That would be very challenging. Uh, middle school, uh, again, similar situation at the middle school. I'm looking at the red. We're at 233 and 252. That seventh grade class last year was, was pretty good sized. Eighth grade was really big that moved to the high school. Again, it, it's tough to do a class average with this just because, you know, but if you have eight sections, so uh, eighth grade's a little bit high. And then, so we're down three at the middle school compared to last spring. Uh, last year at Christmas time, Tom, we had a boatload of folks move in, didn't we? We, we had, a, it's happened twice in the grade class. We didn't have any kids that when they were eighth graders they did that. All right. So um, at Christmas we were we may have been a little bit over five hundred, and right. still five or five something like that. Yeah, and then they dropped a little bit through the spring to, to four eighty eight. But we had a bunch of event at Christmas time. Here's the really the, the unusual. We started when Eileen kind of shut the door, we were right around two fifty at the ninth grade level. Again, we've had over 30 Beach Grove kids move in. Uh, maybe it was athletics, maybe it was Crander uh, Fire Band. I, I don't know. We didn't have any 6'9 centers or any speedy halfbacks move in, unfortunately. But we've never had this before. Now, the good thing in a high school, you can spread kids out. We got a lot of electives and a lot of places you can put them. So you go, oh my gosh, you got all these kids. I mean, you know, you, we can we can put them in. Back in 1975, we had over a thousand kids at Beach Grove High School. Now we didn't have some of the computer labs, and it was a little bit different. Uh, and kids were on half-day programs, but we have housed a lot more. Again, the reason we went to three lunches: one, it's, it's easier because we had kids that quote, quote, couldn't get fed during that lunch time, so we, we've improved the cafeteria with that, and, and it helps with getting kids in and out. Uh, so you know, freshman class is larger than we would like. Uh, but yet we were able to manage it because you know high school is a, a place we can put different kids and we hired an additional English teacher to help with that uh, last year we had we had an additional science teacher we had hired in the past uh, we also hired a different additional social studies teacher for this year the good thing is we have the funding to do that because the money follows the kid uh, and so up right now high school we're up total district as of today I guarantee you that'll change. We're up 127 kids, district-wide. Mainly at the high school, we're up 97 at the high school. Again, we've got two weeks to go before ADM date. That number will most likely go, goes down, go down, it normally does. Uh, but we're up a little bit. And again, in addition to that, we still have 91 waiting to get in. But again, uh, I can't imagine us taking kids until this semester unless we have a huge drop between now and then. So. I, I guess I wanted to point out that, you know, this is not about just about money. Uh, it does help us fiscally, but I think what's really cool is that we've got 91 kids that still want to come here. Uh, that, that says a lot about a school corporation. And unfortunately, Eileen has been the, she's been the evil villain, and she's been the great person that calls up and says, hey, we got a spot for you. But everything runs through her, and I will tell you, she is the most patient, polite, and caring person on the phone. Uh, she had the joy of taking 
five wonderful siblings from IPS last week. That was the last ones we admitted. Uh, and they were, and uh, uh, Tom told them they could come. I, I taught them after they were about ready to do hat, back handsprings. I told them they could not wear their manual jackets on campus though. The five wonderful little girl, young girls from fifth grade through high school enrolled, and that was our, our last group. So uh, I, I will tell you, I can't tell you we do it scientifically, but we do this very carefully. We just don't say, okay, come in. We look at it every day and, and try to keep that class size down. And again, the ninth grade class is really, really an unusual uh, setting from that standpoint. Yes, I have another question. What would you offer to help them if they had? Over 30. Yeah, we get over 30, we're going to bring in some help. So, any elementary. Yeah. I, I'm not sure how, you know, I'm not sure how they would use an aid. We've got three middle school experts back there that can give us some insight on how aid might help in middle school. Uh, I, I'm not sure how feasible that is, or the high school, but uh, K through six, it would definitely have a good impact if, if we get above 30. So we, we had discussed talking to the University of Indianapolis. Did we get any of that? No. I struck out twice. I've even talked to the president. I went over and met with him and talked to him personally about getting some people over to help and do things. And, you know, luckily we have the financial resources. We could pay for AIDS because. Uh, so I thought it would be a win win. Yeah, well, they, they're really not interested. I talked to Dr. Summers and I talked to Dr. Emanuel about it on two years apart. And, and uh, you know, and, and maybe it's just it's not part of their vision right now what they're interested in doing. So. Yes. said look at column D number 16 we have 16 lottery kids at ninth grade we could not let any of those kids in so we, we held the line at 250 but we've had 30 Beach Grove people move in now I don't know how many of those were they were told they couldn't get in so they were in a department we, we've had that and you know our, our goal and I've said it before is and the mayor and I talked about this uh, you know if we can get them in a little bit you know if they live out of district we'll get something to move in I'd love to have that data I don't know how to get it but we've got, we've got a lot of houses in Beach Grove for sale, and, and you know, we're, we're telling people, well, the sure way to get it is buy a house or mm -hmm. move here. And we'll continue to try to sell that message. Well, and Dr. Eric Matt Water, which was number two. And oh, yeah. We yeah. had no clue. Number two is a great number. Yeah, we were like, that's and great. We never promised anyone anything. We, we never did that. But who would have thought number two would have gotten in? And, and it's, just, yeah. it's just amazing that we'll be traveling. When I Eileen took over as the transfer coordinator, it was humongous for us. And I, I mean, we were kind of each doing our own little thing, but to have it centralized with her has been extremely helpful. So thank you for, thank you for taking it over for us because it has helped us all be on the same page. Thank you. Thank you. That's actually really important. 
Okay. And we've got, according to Shelly today, I, I checked with Shelly Connor, we have 36, but we have three on the list. To, right. Now that is one place we do have capacity. Yeah, we do. And, 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 they're, and they're in these numbers as you see them. Yeah, because there's rooms there we're not using. Oh yeah, and, and yeah, and there's, we've got, we can house 50 to 55 kids. And we even have uh, parents from outside the district who want to come in, they want to go to the Richmond Academy over the main high school just because they've heard about it. And uh, we talked the other day, our next push is to get a lot of these former Beach Grove students that are four cut it short, five cut it short, because, you know, we have it all day during the day, then two nights a week, we have it open from three to five for kids from this building to go over. Last year, we had a parent from Franklin Township who came over and finished her, her diploma. She had three kids. And so we really want to push the Richmond Academy as an outreach to those that, you know, they're shorter cuts. Let's come back and let's get this diploma. What's the age cut on? There is none. There was a student that uh, at the Cater Central way back when, while I was there, they were like 85 and came back and, we worked to get their diploma. There's no end to that. That's awesome. So, you know, they're out there. And so we talked about getting a new story done with Melody to start promoting. We just haven't done it yet. That's one of our, our tasks is, okay, how many people went to Beach Grove, didn't graduate, would like to have that Beach Grove diploma? So um, that's kind of one of our next adventures. And again, it doesn't cost us any more money. We're there. We teach the teachers and aides are working after school. We just got to get them in. And what's really neat, they can do it at home. And once they come in, they can do some of the work on Plato at home, then come in and take their test, you know, in the after school session. So, I, again, I would encourage you to uh, give us a couple weeks and come back, come by from 3 to 5 on Tuesdays and Thursday and see that, how that rock and rolls and how that works. It's a, it's a good program. At what age does the funding stop? It stops at, eight, at high school. We don't get any funding for that. Okay. Uh, I, you know, we're just trying to get our, our, our community better educated and get them to graduate. So, we don't. We're not an approved adult ed program, you know. Right now, that goes to Warren and to Wayne and to the big biggins. The state puts special money into them. Uh, you know, uh, C, there's a there's a GED program through C9 that's housed at our community center. They get some funding. We we get no additional funding for doing the evening stuff. We're just trying to get our uh, our parents and uh, more kids involved. Questions on enrollment. Hopefully, that answers some questions and some myths. That might have been floating out there. Okay, let's move on. Okay. Motion to approve donations. Does anybody have any questions before we do that? <laughs> Motion to approve the donations. <clears throat> Second. Second. Tim, all in favor? Aye. Uh, opposed? Um, Chromebooks. Is Tim supposed to be here? No, I told him to stay home. Uh, basically, uh, we're transitioning from our Arcuno tablets to a Google Chromebook. And uh, what a Google Chromebook is, it's basically it's, it's a laptop, and what's really great about it, it works on Google system, which is wonderful. And, uh, you know, we've, we've talked to our kids. Uh, they want a laptop. Tablet's fine, but it really doesn't create what we want. So uh, being the person that have learned from this, we're doing a pilot. So we bought 170-something. Uh, some of those are going to go to... to uh, uh, South Grove and some are going to go to the high school, some of the freshmen. And uh, <clears throat> Big news today, we received notification from the State Department of Education that Brian and my application to be able to fund this is approved. Thank you. Awesome. Well, we thought uh, that. It's, <laughs> a loan, but it's a loan that we can stretch out. Our, our goal is this school year is to transition the entire high school to some type of Google Chromebook. Franklin Community High School bought 2,000 of these, uh, what's called the Dell Chromebook. There's four or five different manufacturers. Uh, the ones we bought are Super Bertha strong ones. And uh, we had a shortage of tablets, and we didn't want to spend more money on tablets, so we were starting to transition the, the Chromebook. But again, our goal is to get the high school done this year, and then hit South Grove and uh, the middle school. Uh, we have implemented uh, uh, iPads, K3, which will be very successful, we hope. so. That this is our, our pilot. Would you like to make, to make a motion to approve the purchase of the Chromebook? I would like to make a motion to approve Tim, it. Four, I will second. I'll third that in battle. Great. Rick, <laughs> third. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Opposed? Okay, we need to approve some additional 2014 15 fundraisers. Anybody have any questions about those? We'll approve them. 
So moved. Yeah. We'll second. We'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Out of state overnight FFA field trip. Motion to approve. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? And boy, FFA is going to Calgary. Woohoo! It's beautiful. <laughs> Can I say something about the FFA real quick? I'm doing a project down in uh, Greensburg, Indiana. And uh, the FFA gentleman had his jacket on. I said, hey, you scrub just got an FFA program a couple years ago. He goes, yeah, I know. Oh. And I said, really? He goes, you guys are making big waves. How big it's gotten and how popular. You know, you guys have done a great job up there. I said, yeah, I know. <laughs> we have the second largest in the state, outside of Jake County. That's awesome. It is awesome. Hmm. So for somebody in Greensburg to recognize Beach Grove in our FFA program, That's I really think cool. that filled me with pride. That was pretty cool. I'll make a motion for them to go to that overnight field trip. I'll make a motion. Tim, second. Tim, second. Tim, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? To approve the HPAC, HPAC and Luther project. Does anybody have rights? Yeah, basically this has been a year-long uh, love affair in all seriousness. The, the RISE building was built back in the late 60s, and very simply, the air conditioning doesn't work anymore. Uh, we have three classrooms right now that we have portable air in, and uh, performance services doing that project. We worked, again, uh, last summer we took money out of our capital projects for all four schools, and we put in the, the, the main unit itself, but it doesn't do any good when the units don't work. So. Uh, we've got temporary air. Uh, we spent a lot of time on the good thing that this is prorated set by, based on your number of students on December 1st. So we pay the smallest share because we have the smallest budget. But uh, a lot of discussion with the superintendents. We've set up, a, in essence, an escrow account. One of the concerns was what, what if one of the school districts leaves? And so we have a, a million dollars in cash balance. So we're setting up a $510,000 escrow, which is a fancy name, we're going to move it from one account to the other in case someone pulls out and they can't pay the, it's going to be a five year loan to do it. And uh, it's a million six max, but we haven't decided to, we're going to go 1.6, 1.3. And that includes all the HVAC, roof, and uh, some lighting. Which, and we'll have about $50,000 a year in savings by doing it. Can you tell them what other schools? Yes. Uh, we're in a, we're in a, uh, Southside Special Services Co-op with uh, Beach Grove, we're the smallest school. Uh, then it's uh, Franklin Township, uh, Decatur Township, and Perry Township. In order of size, it's Perry, Franklin, Decatur, and us. So all the building and all the expenses and even legal services are all based on a percentage of students, total special ed population in, in each school corporation. We've got a great uh, leader, Lil Youngblood, she is kind of the superintendent. Uh, I have the privilege of being the board president for the last four years. I, I can't find anybody to take it, but I tell you right now, if you're having a bad day, go to the Rise Learning Center mm -hmm. and see what those kids do and how those teachers work. It's 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 uplifting on uh, what takes place in that building, and so we're excited to get the air fixed. And that's also the heat, by the way, uh, for the air right now. And uh, you know, once uh, uh, I think Franklin's the last school board meeting. Once that's done, we order the equipment. And we'll get started and get it knocked out before uh, jingle bells and Christmas time. <laughs> we'll make a motion to approve the contribution. To motion rise. to approve. Okay. Second, please. I'll second. Jamie, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, and then we need to talk about the Winston Terrell group. Do you need to, yep. anybody have any questions about that? Have we really group? talked enough about it? You know, it well, uh, I mean, I, I think the night we met, there was consensus to utilize it. Uh, they are, in my opinion, the best in the state. They've been working with us as we move forward with this. Uh, this is much less expensive than we used previously uh, with uh, Dion Willis. And uh, there they help Elkhart, Perry, Bremen, uh, about four or five other school districts win their referendums. And uh, they have. How many did? Uh, just a couple. They also uh, did uh, Linda, uh, uh, Glenda Ritz campaign and uh, helped her with yeah. So, Isn't there something in Dropbox on them? Yes, the contract was in Dropbox. Everybody read it? Anybody have a question? Uh, again, I, I, I know uh, 
it is a different time and if we're going to be successful moving forward with our transportation and our technology referendum we're going to need their services the information that they provide yes the insights and the political process and voting process is far beyond what we have the capability to do and i think i think uh, and more importantly is the communication tools that they have available with our community and the insights they have so motion to approve the agreement i'll second that all in favor? Aye. Opposed? <coughs> okay. We had several people not say anything. Karen didn't say anything. Mike didn't say anything. Beth didn't say anything. Nancy didn't Mine, say anything. See, I'm, I'm not quite. Mm. I don't see it in my Dropbox, first of all. So I haven't reviewed it, to be quite honest. Do you want to take another vote? Well, Oh, it's under. And I know that they came and talked to us several months ago, but I do not remember the figures within. Three thousand dollars fine. For. For their services. Mm -hmm. For how many months? Uh, between now uh, and the springtime, and the referendum. And I apologize. I was at thirty, I think. And, and and I will tell you the important thing is they will also lead our fundraising efforts. You know, we'll establish a pact, which uh, has the ability to, to, based on the funding capabilities, to take care of some of those expenses related to that. Uh, they have raised quite a bit of money with Perry and the other school corporations. So I, I'm not going to sit here and tell you it's it's going to be cost neutral from that standpoint because. The other part of that is, is really just working for us on the overall, uh, you know, campaign and public relations. Uh, and I'm not seeing it. And part of their services will include determining whether it's appropriate to ask for the second question. Absolutely. That, that we talked. We met with them today. And, and, and one thing I have planned for the work session is to get this really go into more detail about that. Uh, you know, I'm not ready to say today we need to second question until we survey our parents in our community. Uh, there's no doubt we have to do transportation where we can't afford to lose 1.5 million dollars. Uh, whether we go, and again, that's that's tax neutral. And, uh, I will share with you that in, from 2007 to today, our tax rate has only gone up five cents, and that includes the 35 cent referendum. And uh, now, how do we get that message out to our community that the the referendum main question is tax neutral, and, and that's where their expertise comes. Personally, for me, I don't see the reason why I'm agreeing to this is because they can help us target parts of the community that that are specific to the referendum instead of us calling and, and knocking on doors of people that that um, like we had to ask. Like we well, you Tammy, know. the polling that they're going to do is really going to be very valuable for us, and that's really good. I have a lot access of times to I think having a, another party do that rather than the school. We're going to get some more honest answers, I think, of what people are thinking, what they're wanting from all the different groups here. Yeah, and what information do you want? Yeah. There were also senior citizens that felt like they didn't have to come maybe they all. It matter that their kids went here and benefited, they didn't care anymore. So we had to make them understand that they weren't being taxed with so much that they couldn't pay it, that it wasn't going to affect them financially. They didn't understand it until, but we called and called and people, you know, and this kind of thing. And just, you know, again, I, I've had a chance to be with them several times um, since we met with them, and they will give us a laser focus on what our community needs to know. You know, I, I tell people, Tom and I and, and, uh, and uh, Laura and, and, and company and the bus drivers, you know, we just went out and said, hey, please help us. And, and I think it's a different time. You know, I, I think people want answers. They want specifics. They they really want to know more information about it. And, and how do we reach them? Let me ask you a question. They have access to that where yeah. the late they're, person right. doesn't. They're, they're, we they're don't. Voting records they have some experience. Yeah. We, none of us do. Uh, do we have to vote on it today? No. I no. know you want to, but the reason that I'm asking 
is would there be a way for them to come <coughs> up to us to make people, you, sure. know, you know, new board members who are familiar, if they can that. come and talk before we vote on it to Absolutely. make sure that they understand what, yeah, what the, bang we're getting for our folks. Yeah. Uh, uh, they would be very glad to do that, I'm sure. Well, and they did, they have come, yeah. right? Yes. And they were the ones that we were here with for the school. Would you like to talk to them again? No, I just had not seen the contract. It's, I apologize. It's, here, is it? I, I, it's my fault. I thought <laughs> I put it in there. The there contract is in here. So. It's and, in I, here. and I will it's say, in. I wasn't yeah. on the board last time when you It's under remaining board, items. So I didn't, I was oh. unaware of that even when they entered. When okay, they entered it's under the remaining time. items. Uh huh. If I, if I could see without my glasses, it would be better. I think it was attached to another, there it is. It's, it was attached to, it was attached to the conflict of interest. I should have had that out in a separate document. Underneath the memorandum of understanding, I guess. Yeah, there. The demographics that give us locations that do all the access. So you have it on. And then you know how many parents live in. Um, there is at the very, very. An apartment, certain apartment complexes. Very so, interesting. like Dr. Kaiser said, the laser focus that they allow will yeah. we'll just do the way that we were. Not that we would work at Iowa City again, but we'd we'll be up somewhere. So it's up on the screen right now. And it's a standard contract. You know, I mean, well, I, mean, I think regardless, what, I think it would be beneficial. I, again, I would appreciate it if we just move forward with it. But I'll have them come to the next work session. And we'll kind of give you an update on our strategic planning and where we are and, and you know, uh, and, and, and that status report. Because, you know, uh, July or uh, May 5th will be here before you know it. We've got a lot of work to do. They're, 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 they're a dichotomy of, uh, of uh, personalities, but they are both but They're both top very, notch. they're excellent. They're effective in their own way. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of, it is kind of, yeah. Yeah. absolutely. There is only different people. But one's a deep thinker, yeah. and the other one's the politician. <laughs> so with the motion <laughs> open, do I need to consider the motion, or do we just vote no until further? Well, I believe we had a motion. That there's was a motion in it. There's a motion on the floor. Yes. Well, motion and a second. Yes. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Stay. Okay. Well, then we only have one to stay. So that means okay. And I'll ask them to come to the next board meeting. To I'm, I'm okay. You're okay? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, okay. We don't have anything else. I don't think anybody have any more stories. I, I, I do want to connect. I, I, there's been a lot of discussion about the dress code. So in our work session, I've asked the principals to give a brief summary uh, of what's taken place. Uh, it, Wendy, would you mind reading the quote? Uh, I have a quote from a teacher at the middle school. Um, who said, I believe the new dress code is all tremendously the middle school. Schools are going to be dressed to learn, not to distract And I think, I think that's been the theme. But I, I thought in a work session, just you know, we don't have to have a long session, but I think it's important to hear from the principals, their efforts. I know I've been in the buildings, all the buildings, and, and I see I see a huge difference. Uh, and I think the the data that Carmen has is, is pretty interesting. Yeah. You know that he's provided at our table. So, you know, we'll do that in a work session. Then uh, a few minutes to give you some data. Okay. We'll go from there. Well, actually, actually, what we're doing, the, the tablets from South Grove, we're going to slide to the middle school, okay, and to kind of fill in the gap for a period of time. Uh, so we're not actually sure. You know, we may give them to the students. Uh, we might sell them. We, we only haven't got that far. Uh, there are some schools out there that are still using those, especially the middle school in South Grove are relatively new. Uh, we'll, we'll end up using, I just had a meeting actually today with, um, Mr. Starks here at the high school, and we kind of came up with also a game plan with Chromebooks. We want to make sure that we deploy those to students who will be here for four consecutive years, um, so that all the Chromebooks and then all the tablets that we already own and have been here, we will make sure that we keep them for their life, for the existence. So at least four years they will have been somewhere. So like we are redeploying the South Carolina ones to the middle school and shifting and moving some things around. Um, but our enrollment's up. So actually, 
the Chromebooks fill in the gap of where we don't have devices. So the Chromebooks can then fill in what my plan was is to deploy them to all the ninth grade. Reshuffle um, tablets and reshuffle other things and then that freshman can have the Chromebook for four consecutive years. Turning it in for cleaning and adding a, um, different things onto the computer. So that when they're a senior, at that time, prior to the end of the senior year, we'll make a determination as an administration if they're worthy of us feeling like we can keep them after that fourth year, because essentially they'll be paid for at that end of the fourth year. And at that time, I think that we're leaning right now 75% or higher at, that's going to be that senior's from They can take that and go with that. Because it really isn't as much a, a value to us. And the lease is over, and the buyout of the lease is $1. So I've been working on the finances of this, and I think that keeping them for that lengthy period of time will be advantageous. And then we'll use all of the all of the tablets at the same time because our enrollment's gone up the same number of Chromebooks that we purchased. So we're pretty calculating that. And and the uh, the tablets of the high school they're three years old, and, and a lot of times on that level of device three years is this lifespan. Yeah. Or the ones at South Grove and the, the middle school in their second year. So we'll probably hit high school, go south, go and come back to the middle school. So we'll push those up. Uh, they're still usable in classrooms and stations. I mean, we can take them, use some at Horn Park and, and Central. I mean, so we, we've got some uses, especially for the one that the, the two lower buildings. Those are a year, a step up over the high school ones. But the high school really at the end of life. I mean, they, and that's why we have to do something. There. And they're not as functional for the high school. The high school needs a laptop. You know, that's, that's just the reality of it. And what's great about Google, you can be anywhere in the world, as long as you have internet, you can ask to access your own personal files on, on the Google Chromebook. It, most of the schools are going to that. Uh, again, Franklin, uh, Mooresville, uh, Wayne, Wayne, Texas. I mean, so, uh, so we're going to pilot first and then make a decision come December on where we go, which one we go with. Thank you. Any other questions, concerns, comments, suggestions? Okay. All right. Who'd like to second the motion to adjourn? I'll second. Tammy, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No comments. We're adjourned.